Good evening, everyone. My name is Philip Jones, a second chance. And today is our 2022 Home and In Center Dialysis Conference of uh, the Good, the Bad, the Ugly. And today we're going to talk about a number of things. Uh, today's is a uh, day informative from a number of different people, um, patients, professionals. Um, you know, and so we just want to give you guys some uh, some information to be able to take with you, whether you're already in dialysis or you're making a transition or will have to in the future. Uh, just some things that you need to know about which type of dialysis you're currently doing or could possibly do in the future. Again, my name is Philip Jones. Uh, next up, I'll have Marcus Falk uh, come up and say a few words. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Tafaro Cook, uh, two-time kidney transplant recipient and uh, founder of Kidney Care Coaches, where we coach people with stage three to stage five kidney disease. Today is going to be a wonderful show. Like I said, like Phil said, we have great people on here. They got inside, firsthand knowledge about dialysis, the good, the bad, the ugly. We're going to be talking about um, nutrition, you know, ways to overcome uh, challenges you have on dialysis and uh, just stay tuned. It's going to be a wonderful show. I'm looking forward to hear from everybody. Go ahead, uh, Jonathan. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Jonathan Trailer. I'm a kidney transplant recipient, and uh, I'm, I'm blessed to be here. I'm the host of Hope with Jonathan, and uh, I look forward to being a part of this uh, great panel of uh, kidney warriors, kidney advocates. Um, and I uh, just really appreciate uh, being a part. And um, shout out to uh, Phil and Tafaro for putting this together and inviting me to uh, be on this panel, this great panel. Thank you again. Uh, so today, uh, our event is going to be hosted by Eric Nickley. Eric was our uh, first kidney uh, conference that we did in November. And she had some issues that she had to take care of at that time. So we told her then we, we bring you back. So get ready. So, uh, you know, we said it happened. So um, we just want to, you know, definitely uh, say thank you for Erica taking the time today. We appreciate her and her time and dedication to the Oregon transplant uh, community uh, and for being with us today. Erica, how are you? Can you hear? Can hear. Erica, are you on mute? Erica, you might be muted. I'm muted. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm okay. I said thank you so much, Philip. I appreciate you all and all of the hard work that you're doing out there in the community. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, no problem at all. Thank you for again for joining us. Um, so uh Keith was is actually stuck in Buffalo. They had issues, so um, Erica is going to be uh, uh, our our host day uh, by herself, um, which is still going to be uh, great. So, Erica, uh, the show. Is Thank you, everyone. Welcome to the 2022 Home and In Center Dialysis Conference. You're going to have an amazing time today. You're going to hear about physical education. You're going to hear about what to do and not to do when you're on dialysis. You're going to hear about dietary needs and what you need to do with your diet. You're going to hear from so many different fantastic guests today. So stay tuned, get your pen and pad ready so you can take notes and make sure that you're being detailed. This is being recorded so you can always go back to the live, but please be sure to take detailed notes. I myself, Erica, I am a filmmaker, attorney, and activist. I work in the kidney community by celebrating people just like your panelists. I've been working on a film for the past 12 years following three patients with kidney disease that should be out in the fall. And I love to be around all of these wonderful presenters. And I just love to hear all the information. So what I'd love to do without further ado is get started. We have several presenters, but we're gonna kick it off with Mr. Jonathan Trailer. He is, he's gonna to talk to us about home hemodialysis. Mr. Jonathan Trailer, he's a husband, father, and friend. Jonathan survived a near-death experience with kidney failure. He has a passion for all things kidney and now uses his personal story to encourage 
and to give hope to those that are suffering with kidney disease. He now advocates for organ donation for kidney patients, and he is grateful and blessed to share his messages of hope with others. Because of his experience with kidney disease, he started an online streaming show podcast called Hope with Jonathan. It has reached so many people, had so many phenomenal guests. Without further ado, let's welcome Jonathan Trailer. Jonathan, the mic is yours. Thanks again, Erica, for that uh, great introduction. And yes, as you guys heard, uh, my name is Jonathan Trailer. I'm a now a, a kidney transplant recipient, and um, as she was saying in the um, the uh, forward there, that I had experienced a near death experience in uh, July of 2019, and that was due to uh, type two diabetes and hypertension being uncontrolled for many years. And uh, I uh, lived a lifestyle of just doing whatever I wanted and uh, ate what I wanted, and I had no uh, exercise routine. I had no uh, routine of uh, seeing a doctor uh, on a regular basis. And uh, I was, uh, I sort of thought I was immortal and uh, I was wrong. And uh, that lifestyle ended up landing me flat on my back and uh, in an emergency room. And uh, what I was thought I would have been fighting the flu for a few days. No, it was end stage renal disease. I was at stage five and I didn't even know it. And uh, it was one of the most traumatic uh, experiences that I had ever gone through in my life. And uh, without the prayers and support of my family and uh, friends, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here right now talking with you. I was, uh, the doctors had came to me later on and said that I was around 30 minutes from death. And uh, my, my levels were completely out of whack. Uh, when I say that, I mean, my potassium level was a nine, and uh, which is really, really high. Um, but Ultimately, uh, I ended up uh, in my local hospital uh, after uh, having some pro issues with breathing and things like that. Uh, my wife had just begged me for uh, days to get uh, to the emergency room and uh, ultimately um, you know, realized that I, I couldn't get out of bed. When I tried to get out of bed, I, I fell on the floor. I had no strength at all. And uh, there was a lot of signs and symptoms looking back that you know, I had uh, really swollen legs, really swollen ankles. Uh, and I was in, in bad shape, uh, but I didn't know what I was fighting. I literally thought I was fighting the flu virus. Uh, I was very nauseated and had uh, chronic fatigue, and uh, I was just in, in really poor shape. But again, I thought I was fighting the flu, but actually, nope, it was kidney disease, and I, I didn't realize it, but I was in the end final stages of it. Um, I'm telling you, I'm sharing you all this because my actually what I'm supposed to be talking about is home hemodialysis. I'm just trying to trying to get you an idea of, of how I ended up there. Uh, so uh, after uh, I went to my local hospital and they got me there and realized that I was in end stage uh, you know, kidney failure, uh, they did not have a dialysis machine there at this hospital. So therefore, they put me in a helicopter, stat flighted me to a hospital in San Antonio, and I spent about two weeks there. And I got a crash course in dialysis education, kidney disease education, uh, renal diet education, and a lot of different terms and terminology were, were coming at me and flying at me. And at the whole time, I was, uh, I was trying to uh, understand all the uh, medical terminology that they were talking about. I was dealing with the fact of what, I, what had just happened to me. And so it was, uh, it was a scene out of your... Uh, your favorite sitcom, your your favorite movie, uh, you know, um, a medical sitcom, if you will, ER, Grey's Anatomy, whatever, you, what have you. Uh, I lived it. I experienced it. And uh, it was a, a very life altering, um, life changing event uh, that was uh, my eyes were wide open, so to speak. And um, I, I, for about two weeks, I, I, I was at the uh, hospital there in San Antonio. And uh, at the amazement of the nurses and doctors, I actually survived that uh, experience. And um, they had prepared my family for like three or four days that I wasn't going to pull through. But, wow. but God had other plans for me. And, uh, and he, he began to uh, work with the prayers uh, of my family and the uh, support of my friends. And uh, the medical staff there was amazing, incredible. Uh, with God-given abilities, they were able to to, to save me with uh, uh, dialysis. And I did in-center dialysis uh, there at the hospital for the first two weeks. And then when they finally got me into a chair time at DaVita, 
uh, here in my local city. I did in-center dialysis uh, for about 10 months at a local DeVita. And uh, let me just say this, uh, not everyone's story uh, is the same. Uh, every one of our stories is uh, unique. Uh, and uh, we, we all have our own uh, story. So I can only share my story, my experience, but not everyone uh, experience uh, with, you know, these uh, dialysis centers are, are the same. But uh, I can tell you that my local uh, DeVita was great. And uh, they would answer any question that I had. And uh, I was really blessed to have a great staff, a lot of seasoned uh, veteran technicians at this uh, local um, uh, DeVita here in uh, Kerrville, Texas. And um, I began to go into in center and I was still a very sick man, uh, but they began to uh, do uh, administer uh, uh, hemodialysis. So, of course, when I left the hospital, I had no choice. Of course, when I showed up in an emergency situation, uh, there was no time to like talk about modality choices. I was basically forced to do the, the central line in my chest. Uh, so I started off with like an IJ in my neck and they converted that to a permacath. And then uh, I left the hospital with that. And then that's how they administer the hemodialysis uh, in center uh, for probably about three or four months. And then they kept telling me, you know, they wanted me to get a fistula installed. And, uh, you know, and so I, I ended up getting that uh, a few months later here on my uh, left wrist. And uh, they began to uh, administer dialysis through that fistula probably around six weeks later. And um, they, they had some great treatments, uh, the first three. And then they told me I could go get my uh, my central line taken out, and then of course I come back, and they let me know that they were having they were having trouble uh, sticking me uh, after those first three, and I'd already taken out the central line. So I, I did have a couple of little bumps in the road here and there that uh, a lot of patients have uh, with uh, uh, problems with finding the fistula because it wasn't mature enough, and uh, you know infiltration and things like that. And uh, but uh, eventually the fistula matured enough and uh, actually my uh, my vascular surgeon came over with the vein mapping machine and and, and showed them where to stick me. My my fistula is sort of like the uh, a shape of a candy cane. Uh, it's just the way that it, it kind of looks and uh, they were having sort of trouble finding it. But once they figured it out, I was in good shape. And so I did in center dialysis for around 10 months. And then I progressed to finally, they came to me and said, we think you'd be a great candidate for home dialysis. Uh, and part of the reason of that was because uh, I had asked so many questions. I was so engaged with my team uh, there. I, I mean, I began to ask questions, do research on Google, uh, begin to just kind of self-educate myself. And then also my, my, my staff there, DeVita, they were willing to talk with me and educate me on uh, what, you know, what the parts of the machine do and what the, what, you know how the program uh, runs on the on the machine, and uh, what 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 they were uh, what this hose and line was for, and uh, what the dialyzer actually does, and and you know all this stuff. And I started asking a lot of questions right away because I was just that type of patient, and um, I learned so much. I think I was actually getting to a point that I was getting on their nerves, <laughs> so to speak. So uh, they came to me and said, "Hey, we think you'd be a great candidate for home hemodialysis. What what do you think?" And I said, well, sure, let me let me take a look. So they hand me a pamphlet and I go home and I show my wife and uh, they wouldn't let me do it by myself. They said I needed a care partner. Uh, this is just the way my facility did. I know a lot of people, a lot of warriors, they stick themselves and, and all of that. And that, that's amazing. Uh, shout out to those that, that can do that. But uh, my team was like, no, you, you need a care partner. So uh, my, my wife, uh, I came home, I talked it over with my wife. I showed her some videos on by way of YouTube. And uh, she she believed that she could help me and she she signed on with me and we started uh, probably around the month of May in 2020. And uh, we started training and we we did training for probably around three weeks of home hemodialysis training. And uh, to my surprise, my wife was sticking me by the third day of training. Uh, they actually showed her the first couple of days how to do it. And then by the third day, they had her hands on and actually uh, sticking me with the needles. My wife had never done anything like that before, but uh, so shout out to my wife, Melissa. She's, she's amazing. And uh, she jumped right in, rolled her sleeves up and began to stick me. And, uh, and she, she picked up on it uh, really quickly. 
And uh, with about three weeks of uh, all this great hands-on training that we received at our local DeVita, uh, I came home and started doing dialysis uh, at home. And um, uh, true story, we, we had actually gone over uh, return of blood in case of an emergency. So like uh, if the power goes out or any of that. So we, we had went over that a couple of times during our training. And I believe in our first week or first two weeks of training, we had to do uh, an emergency return of blood uh, two times during that um, wow. first first two weeks of uh, administering home hemodialysis. And my wife was a trooper. She went right into, you know, uh, everything that they trained her. She knew the steps. She knew exactly we didn't we didn't have to pick up the phone. Uh, we didn't panic or call 911 or any of that. My wife just went right into the mode of everything that we covered in the training that we received. And we were able to uh, get through that with the uh, re the emergency return of blood. And uh, so it was uh, definitely uh, we got we got tested a few times, uh, went through a couple of machines. Uh, I had some uh, I had I had some uh, machines that were uh, faulty. My first uh, two machines had some problems, uh, mechanical problems. But uh, shout out to Next Stage. They always re uh, delivered me another machine within 24 hours. So I never missed a treatment, never missed a treatment. But uh, my first delivery, if you guys are uh, wondering about that and how that goes, uh, I had my first delivery. It was around 74 boxes. And so um, it was a lot of boxes. I was amazed at the amount of boxes that I had received um, to do home hemodialysis. I was thinking it was going to be around 40, but no, it was like 74. And uh, I had boxes going down the hallway. I, had a, I have a, a closet that I dedicate to, um, to, to all my supplies and things like that. And if you're wondering about uh, all the steps and all that and everything that we learned during uh, home hemo, I will tell you that uh, sterilization was one of the major uh, keys to being successful with uh, home hemo and uh, organization. Organization is huge uh, when you're when you're doing home dialysis, and so uh, being sterile and clean, and then being uh, being able to stay organized is are huge uh, factors in doing home uh, dialysis. And uh, the way that we did that was by you know we bought like tubs and we put labels on the tubs, and we knew exactly where everything was. And uh, I also had uh, bought a cart. Uh, that I had the machine on with supplies and things like that. So, uh, but other than that, guys, uh, home hemo was awesome for me. Uh, it was a great experience. Uh, it got me out of uh, in-center dialysis. And one of the major reasons why I wanted to uh, get out of in-center was because uh, I, I had actually was like at the peak of COVID. Things like that were going on. And it was um, really... Uh, a time for me that I really needed to get into home hemodialysis. And I really felt like it was a great opportunity because of COVID and things like that. So that was one of the one of the main factors of why I wanted to switch to home hemo. But also I wanted to do dialysis on a schedule that uh, pertained to like uh, my, my lifestyle uh, because I, I feel like I was sort of becoming institutionalized, uh, stuck on like the Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday routine. So uh, I was able to, you know, do dialysis anytime that I wanted uh, by going on home hemodialysis. And uh, in no way, shape or form uh, am I knocking in-center dialysis because it was great to me uh, for a time and period that I needed it. And uh, I, I still believe in in-center dialysis. Uh, but, you know, some patients, you know, got to do what they got to do. And I felt like that was the best option for me. Uh, so uh, I progressed to... Uh, home hemodialysis. And believe it or not, guys, I, I did that for around three months. And then I got the call for transplant. So after after we learned all that information and learned how to work the machine and learned all the alarms and learned how to set up the machine and, and getting organized, uh, I was blessed to get the call for, for a transplant. And so uh, it, I was very blessed, a very blessed patient uh, sitting here that was, you know, called... I, I'm an old, old kidney, so um, I was on the wait list. I was told six to eight years was probably going to be the wait. Wow. And, um, but God God blessed me with a, uh, a miracle. And my, my story is kind of unique. I, I don't want to share. Uh, I won't share the complete story, but I, I, I was direct donated to by a family, a friend of the family that had passed away. And so I have their son's kidney. 
And uh, that's a whole story for another time. But, uh, I, you know, I truly believe that uh, God had a plan for me. I, I, I survived the near-death experience and then uh, ended up getting um, a friend of the family's kidney. So, um, you know, you can't you can't really make this stuff up. It was it was definitely handwritten by by the hand of the Lord. But um, guys, listen, uh, my name is Jonathan Trailer. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity for you to listen to me. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was an amazing story. I, I really would love to say I've heard your story before, but every time I hear it, it really just touches my heart. Before you go, Jonathan, let me just say we're here to talk about the good, the bad and the ugly. Besides mm -hmm. those 74 boxes and finding a place to keep them, what were some of the other challenges you had with, with the home dialysis process? Uh, some of the challenges I would think would be uh, pertaining to deliveries. So I had to coordinate my delivery with a company in San Antonio. It wasn't a local company. So I had a little bit of problem sometime with uh, delivery times. And uh, one day I remember it was a delivery day and um, the delivery didn't show. And then like the next day I woke up and there was uh, about 70 boxes sitting outside at the door. And so I was like, OK, <laughs> so uh, sometimes the delivery uh, was a little bit off. So I had a little bit of problem and it was like a third party. So uh, to get a hold of someone to fix it was a little bit tough. Um, that they, you know, I guess my local DeVita had a third party that they were kind of working with. So there, that was kind of one of the obstacles that I had. Uh, I will say also that the boxes were quite heavy uh, for someone that was sort of weak and puny at the time, you know, still on the dialysis, not in the greatest of shape. Um, so had I, had I not had my son here or, or someone to kind of help me lift some of the boxes, as you know, dialysate uh, inside the box is quite heavy, uh, you know, or they, they weigh quite a bit. Uh, so, um, sometimes it was a little bit of a struggle. I had to, you know, lift about four or five and I'd have to stop and then come back and get the rest of them, you know, and do that. And it was a, it, it was my daily, I, I got my exercise in for that day for sure. So. Wow. And I, I hear you, I heard you say at the beginning that, if you didn't have a home caregiver, you wouldn't be able to go on home dialysis. Can you tell us just a little bit more about, and with all of the physical activity, so people who don't have a caregiver at home, they do not qualify for home dialysis? Is that correct? No, that's not really true. I mean, there are people out there that are on home dialysis and they do all of it themselves. Uh, it was just my local center was like, we really feel like it would be better for you to have a caretaker or a caregiver or a care partner. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I did things. I, I helped uh, set up and prime the machine. I, I got all the boxes uh, cut open and got the bags out and of uh, dialysate and things like that. So I was, um, I was in involved. So, but uh, it, yeah, it, no, not, that's not exactly true. I mean, you, there are, there are patients out there that, that do it all. Wow, and, and and that is that's a phenomenal feat to get to get through. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Jonathan, for your time. And I don't if any of the other uh, guests would love to ask Jonathan a question. Otherwise, we can move on to our next presenter. Is there anyone that would like to come off their mic and ask Jonathan a question? I would. How do I? I would like to ask a question. Absolutely. You, um, you were uh, this. This is because I I never done the home. And, the, you know, I know in center uh, you run three days a week um, mm -hmm. and whatever the hours. But when you're at home, or is it still um, three days a week or is it you can run every day less time or um, how does that is it your own discretion of, of, of your run time? And when do you run? I know um, how did how did that work for you? It, it, it's all based upon your labs and your KT over V. And so if you're getting good clearance with three or four days, then you're good to go. But if not, then they're going to want you to do more. I had to do five days a week, but I, my, my run time was only about two hours, two, two and a half hours versus four hours on the machine. So uh, the, the way they kind of looked at it was more treatments, uh, less time on the machine. Um, and uh, I felt good about it. I really did because, uh, you know, I felt like I was getting uh, my blood cleansed really well and 
uh, I just, I felt incredible. I mean, I really did. I had a lot more strength than what I did whenever I was in center. Okay. So, Thanks. Great, man. great question. Great question. Fantastic. Well, let's move right along to our next presenter. Thank you, Jonathan. I know you'll no be problem. here. Um, and to the end of the conference. So if anyone has any other questions for Jonathan, we can maybe circle back at the end. So please, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. We'll be checking the chat uh, periodically to see if there are any questions. So please put your questions in the chat. And if not, we'll go on to our next presenter. Our next presenter is Tafaro Cook of Kidney Care Coaches. You saw him briefly in the beginning. And now he'll be talking about manual peritoneal dialysis and in-center hemodialysis. Tafaro, the mic is yours. Hey, everybody. How you doing tonight? Um, so I'm going to pull up a uh, screen. Um, hopefully this will work out all right. Um, hold on. Let me. I have it if you want me to bring it up. Yes, if you can bring it up, that'd be great. Thank you. Wh which one? Let's talk about manual dialysis first. <clears throat> I'm just going to give you a little background on my manual dialysis. Uh, I did manual dialysis for six and a half years. Um, it was a little challenge, but I seem to do it really well. And I just want to give you a brief on what it is and about it. Um, for six and a half years, I could tell you a lot of stories. <laughs> I know we're time on a time schedule, so I'll just keep it brief. Hold on one second, Mr. Cook. Should be up there now. My blurry is what they said. Okay. Um, hi, can you roll it up a little bit so I can start reading? Hold on one second. Uh, trying to see if there's a oh we, this way is fine. Uh let's see. So the biggest is gonna get. If that doesn't work, I, oh wait, my bad. Hold on. If you could just bring it up a little bit, so we can, so I can show people the diagrams and things like that. Okay. Well, right here, <clears throat> this is a, a small little picture of a, how a manual dialysis works. So. Mayo dialysis works where you have a membrane in your stomach. And so what they do is they put the, you have a solution in the bags, because I can't read what I, if you could, can you roll it up a little bit more, Phil, so I can? That's how big the picture came. I know that, but I'm talking about the words. I wanted to, what I, if you can scroll. Uh, up, you you see, scroll I don't up. think it can get bigger, but we can try. It's not bigger if you could scroll up on it because it's. Oh, this is the whole slide. The whole slide is in the frame. Okay, okay. Well, I'm just going to explain then. Um, so manual dialysis, again, uh, we can't see what's going on. So um, I'll just tell you. So you have bags. You get, you, you, just like Jonathan said, they, they deliver a lot of bags to you right to your home. And. With these bags you hook them up to the you have a poet and you hook them up first things first you have to have a sterile environment and i might miss some things so correct me if i'm wrong and stuff but you have to have a sterile environment so what i did was i had a room in my house that was pretty sterile and i used that room i also had a room in my fitness center that i did between my clients so i would uh have all my i would have supplies in my fitness center and i would have supplies at my home and that's where I did my dialysis. So um, again, you have a membrane in your stomach. And what you do is you fill this membrane up with this solution. The solution is uh, dialysate, kind of like a dextrose. It's a sugary uh, substance. You put it in. What happens is all your blood is running through there at one time or another. So that's what happens. You have a, and all the blood goes in there 
Well, well, when the blood goes through there, and that's when it cleanses the toxins from it. And that's how you do your peritoneal dialysis. You also have a dwell time. So my dwell time was when I first started doing it, I started doing it four times a day. But then all of a sudden, I wasn't getting the proper clearance, so I had to do it five times a day. And so my dwell time was probably like three and a half to four hours. So every four hours, I would have to go and do another dialysis, a manual um, <clears throat> dialysis treatment. And so what I did was, and since you can't see it, I always kept a supplies of masks, gloves, betadine, and new caps, because you always had to put a new cap on your, your exercise all the time. And so I would do my treatment. My treatment consisted lasted, it lasted about 45 minutes to an hour. That's what it would last. And so I would do these treatments five times a day. And what we used was different color bags sometimes. So when you used a green bag, the green bag was a neutral bag. A yellow bag was less than neutral, where it gave you a little bit more fluid if you were dehydrated. And then you had a, uh, a red bag. And those red bags were... Red bags will take the fluid off your body. They can also dehydrate you pretty bad also. The biggest thing you had to watch out for in di uh, manual dialysis was uh, peritonitis. Now, I got peritonitis out of six and a half years. I got peritonitis three times. Wow. And every time I got it, it left me in the hospital for about uh, a week or two <laughs> every time. But my doctors always said that was pretty good, just getting it three times out of six and a half years of doing it peritoneal dialysis, which was, um, I'll go ahead and change the slide. Yeah, if you can, I, I didn't know. Okay. Yeah, okay. This is this is where we can read where I'm talking about. It says, it says you have a peritoneal dialysis of type of, type which <clears throat> uses the peritoneum in a person's abdomen as the membrane through which the fluid and the dissolved substance are exchanged with the blood. It is used to remove excess fluid, correct electric lights problems, and remove toxins in those with kidney failure. And another thing, this is talking about the training right here. So <clears throat> I had to go to Ohio State University a couple times, and they taught me how to do it. And they teach you about, it took about two weeks for the treatment for you to learn and everything. And the biggest thing they stressed was peritonitis. You don't want to get peritonitis. And the pain of peritonitis, I can really, really understand why they said they don't want you to get peritonitis because it is very, very painful. I became really, really good at this dialysis treatment. I got so good at peritoneal, perito, uh, peritoneal dialysis that I could go to car shows and everything, and I would do it even in the car. And, you know, and I was pretty good at it. But what happened to me at the end of it was, my KT over V wasn't getting wasn't getting any better. And so I wasn't getting the best dialysis adequacy. What happened then was they started giving me 3,000 size bags. And the bags were big. And that's when my uh, peritoneal sac had burst on my side and I got septic. And I had to stay in the hospital close to 40 days. And I got really, really sick. And that's a whole nother story with that. But one thing I did with the dialysis as well is they always warned us about getting um, having a um, a uh, oh man I can't think of the word um, having a um, oh man uh, what's the uh, thing in your stomach I can't even think of the word right now I'm coming up with a blink um, catheter because you're no not a catheter but uh, when you uh, hey when your stomach uh, a hernia I'm sorry a hernia they always warned oh. us about a hernia so what I did was when I would work out and everything, and I still lifted pretty heavy because I was young and everything, I just kept my core real, real tight when I had that solution in it because I had to be careful with that. But I always did that, and I never got a hernia, and I kept my core real tight when I exercised. You know? But that was another worry they had. So um, that's where I'm going to stop at with uh, manual dialysis. I can go on and off forever about it, but I know we're short on time, so I'll just stop right there. Does anybody have any questions about manual dialysis? Hey, Tafaro, yes, I, we have a question in yes. the chat. There was a question from P. Teach. P. Teach wanted to know what causes perit peritonitis? What caused peritonitis for me was, I, I got it, like I said, I got it three times. One time I got it in the, in the summer and 
I was doing um, an exchange and the window was open and my, when I did the exchange, my catheter got contaminated and that's what happened. And so after that, that's when I got peritonitis and you can catch it any kind of way. And it's kind of like if you don't have a sterile environment and that's what happened. He said, I didn't have a sterile environment. The second time I got it was when I was at the hospital and a doctor, well, a nurse, she's doing my line and she looks at what I have and everything. And she has all the equipment. She's about to do the exchange. And once she looked at it, once she opened my, my, my catheter up and put a cap on, she found out that she had the wrong equipment. So right after she had the wrong equipment, it was too late. And I got peritonitis right then in the hospital. She apologized and everything, but I had to go through the pain. And it was two weeks. It, it, it crushed me. The third time is when my peritoneal sac burst. And that's when I got it. That, but that's what peritonitis is. It's an infection to the peritoneal, peritoneum in, your, in, your, in the membrane in your stomach. And it is very, very painful. And you get it by not being sterile and not being in a sterile environment. So that's what happened to me. That's what it is. Thank you, Tafaro. Uh, we're, we're, we're good on the questions in the chat. If you'd like to move on to in-center hemodialysis. Yep. Okay. So I did, I did hemo, I did in-center hemo uh, dialysis for five and a half years. And again, uh, Phil, can you bring that slide up? Because I just want to show people the good, bad, yeah, and the right pros and cons of it. Okay, thank you. Yes, go, go to the next slide, please. Hold on one second. Hemodialysis is a procedure where a dialysis machine and a specialized filter called an artificial kidney or dialyzers are used to clean your blood. Now, let me tell you, when I first started doing hemo, like I said, this was a long time ago. This is when we were using, you, you had to use your same dial, dialyzer and they would clean them and they would give them right back to you. And use them. Nowadays, they don't do that. Nowadays, they give you a fresh one every time. But that's what they did. Can you go to the next slide? Now, this is a this is a good uh, question right here, and this is a good information right here. The surgeon has to make an access most of the time in your arm. You will have a fistula, a graft, or a central venous catheter, which is called a CVC. So when I first started, I had a CVC in my, my chest, and I was I'm gonna keep it real. I was afraid to get a fistula because I saw how they looked, and I didn't want it all. But eventually, I had to get one because I kept on getting um, I kept on getting the infection in my central venous catheter. And when you get an infection, it, it affects your heart and it makes you feel really, really bad. And so they was giving me medicine and everything. And they told me you have to get a fistula. So I went to get a fistula. What was crazy about getting a fistula was I got 12 surgeries in my arm just to get my fistula working. And so first they tried near my wrist. Then they tried at the, um, the elbow area. Then they tried up high in my arm. <clears throat> so the last one, just like Jonathan said, they came in and they mapped my arm. They found out where the good veins is and the arteries and stuff. And I thought I had good veins because I always exercise. But again, this is a different situation when you're trying to get a fistula. So they eventually gave me a fistula. And what was crazy was the doctor, he told me, he gave me a small little ball right after he gave me, they put the fistula in. He said, I want you to squeeze this ball and this is gonna make more blood in your line. And that way it'll mature faster. Me having a fitness uh, studio and everything, I thought, well, the best way to have blood flow through it is take a dumbbell. So I took about a 15, 20 pound dumbbell and I would just do curls with my arm <laughs> and it matured in three and a half weeks. I go back to the doctor and he's like, I've never seen a fistula, you know, mature that fast. And I was like, yeah, it works. I mean, it's thrilling and everything. And they start using it in four weeks. And once I started running, I ran at 500. Then I start running at 600 on the machine all the time, consistently for four and a half hours. My fistula was really, really good. 
And that's when Ohio State came and did a documentary on my fistula because they was like, we want to show people the quality of um, the quality fistula you have and show the exercises and the things you can do when you have a fistula. Because when you have a central venous line, you can't go swimming. You got to be careful when you take a shower and things like that. And you can't run as high on the machine to give you better uh, dialysis adequacy. And so that's what happened with me. Go to the next one, Phil. Yep. Okay. So most people do dialysis three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or some people do it Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturdays for each hour, four hours of time. I was a bigger guy, so I had to do four and a half hours. Um, the pros and cons of this, can you go to the next one, Phil? Now, this is a, this is a pro right here. These are some of the things when you have a lot of uh, fluid on your body from like a three-day weekend or two-day weekend when you went to a party or something like that, or you might have went to a barbecue, dialysis can make you feel better because it's getting all that fluid off of you. It's getting the toxins off of you and things like that. It can make you feel really, really better. It also can make you feel tired if you have a lot of fluid on you and toxins and, you know, you ran your treatment. It can, So it's either way. You know what I'm saying? These things can happen. It can make you feel better at times. Other times when you got a whole lot of fluid on your body, you know, I've seen people come in with like six or seven kilos on their body and they try to take them down to their dry weight. The dry weight is a weight where you come in and that's the actual weight you weigh without having any extra fluid on your body. And sometimes they try to reach that dry weight. And when you do reach it, it can dehydrate you. It can make you cramp up and it can also make you very, very tired after you do dialysis. And what was crazy for me was I had to always watch my nutrition and fluid because I had to train clients right after I got done with my dialysis. So I would be, you know, scheduling my clients because I wanted my, my fistula to stop bleeding. And I'll be calling my clients like, hey, I'm going to be a half an hour late, you know, to the, to, the, to the gym. But I always made it on time or I always, you know, talk to them before and everything. Because, again, sometimes when you have these fistulas and things, Sometimes it doesn't stop bleeding. They can give you too much heparin. That could be an ugly. I remember one time in um, with um, on hemo where I was on my way to my gym and my arm broke open and I had to go back to the dialysis center so they could stop it and everything. So these are some of the good, bad, and ugly things. Go ahead, Phil. Give me the next uh, slide. This is some of the good right here. You do get days off treatment because you only got to go three times a week. And that's a good thing. Some people don't want to do it every day. You know, I heard people people say, I don't want to do peritoneal because you got to do it every day and so many times or cycle. Or you got to do it every night. So that could be uh, you don't need to be trained to do in-center hemodialysis. That's a good thing. Also, you know, you don't have to you know be trained on it. You can just go there and they just do it for you. A lot of people feel comfortable with them too. You have dialysis nurses and dialysis techs to oversee you if anything goes wrong. And a lot of people like that comfort. That's why they stay in center. And what's crazy about that is, you know, I always talk to people about going home and doing their own dialysis, but a lot of people feel comfortable when they got the dialysis nurses there and the techs. So that can be, you know, a good thing. Let's go to the next slide, Phil. This is some of the ugly right here. If you have a fistula or graft, you have needles in your arm for the entire treatment. Now, a lot of times people don't like to have needles in their arms. I had the biggest gauge needles and I self-cannulated. <clears throat> Excuse me. I self-cannulated. You know, I learned how to do it myself when I was on hemodialysis and I didn't have any problems with it. But again, a lot of people are afraid of needles and they don't want needles in their arms for four and a half hours or four hours. And I understand that. You can also have muscle cramps while on the machine and your blood pressure can drop <clears throat> while doing treatment. And I've seen this happen, too, where all of a sudden somebody cramps up. I've cramped up. You know, I've worked out hard and then go to dialysis the next day and cramp up my hamstring, glutes, my abs. Something cramps up real hard and they got to give you all your fluid back and things like that. So that's some of the ugly. Also, your blood pressure can just crash. And when you see this happens, it's kind of it's kind of eerie if you're in center because they have to fold the person back, throw them back and try to get blood back to their heart and their brain and everything. And it's kind of 
it's kind of crazy when you see that happen. So that could be a little challenge also. Go to the next one, Phil. Thank you. Does anybody have any other questions? Tafaro, I don't see uh, any. Well, yes, we have one from Charles Rice. How long were you on dialysis, Tafaro? When I look at the whole time, I did I did um, six and a half years of peritoneal, and I did five and a half years of hemo before I got my second transplant. So close to 11, almost 12 years, somewhere on there. I always say just a decade because I can't remember everything, but over a decade, I'll say. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Tafaro. Um, we have one more question from uh, Mr. Charles Rice. He wants to know, does your fistula still work? Uh, my fistula stopped working about three years into my second transplant and the doctors were happy. They were like, we wanted it to stop because you know it can uh, keep your heart revving up while you're on, uh, if you're not doing dialysis and things like that. So eventually it clotted off and it's not working, Charles. Thank you for the question though. Okay, thank you kindly. What we'll do, we'll keep on with the program. Our next presenter is <clears throat> Philip Jones, and he's going to discuss cyclopyritoneal dialysis. Philip Jones is a kidney transplant recipient who has battled chronic kidney disease for over two decades. At age four, Philip had strep throat, which attacked his kidneys and caused him to fail and fall to 30% of functionality. At age 17, Philip received a life saving transplant. Three years after that kidney rejected, it caused him to face a number of other illnesses and have to go on dialysis. After facing a number, another, uh, a number of other health challenges, still on dialysis, Philip decided to go back to school and get his degree on March 1st of 2021. In March 1st of 2021, Philip started a Second Chance podcast. Second Chance Podcast highlights the story of courageous individuals and their stories and trials and tribulations with kidney disease. So please, let's welcome Philip to the stage. The mic is yours, Philip. Thank you, Erica. Appreciate you. Uh, today, I'm just going to you know, go over a number of things that have to do with the, the cycler uh, part of peritoneal dialysis. You saw Mr. Cook uh, elaborate on some things that have to do with the angle side of to die to peritoneal dialysis so uh the difference uh as you can see is that here the cycler with what mr cook went over earlier is uh being done by yourself by hand um connecting to bags doing a, a number of these cycles throughout the day uh most people you know start about three maybe four or five uh sessions throughout the day uh mr mr Cookie, how many uh, sessions did you do throughout the day uh, while you were on manual? So at first I started at four and then they said I wasn't getting quite good dialysis adequacy. Then I had to do five treatments a day with 3,000 um, uh, milligram, 3,000 cc, uh, thousand uh, bags. And that, those bags were big. So that's what I did. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, so to start off, uh, with this one second. So uh, the overview, peritoneal dialysis is a way to product from your blood when your kidneys can't adequately do the job any longer. This procedure filters the blood in a different way than does the more common blood filtering uh, procedure called hemodialysis, which we just went over uh, with Mr. Cook and uh, Mr. Trailer as well, um, and the different types of hemodialysis that you can go through um, as a patient. During peritoneal dialysis, uh, a cleaning fluid, I'm oh, sorry, I keep getting these messages, a cleaning fluid uh, flows through, me, through a tube, which is a cath your catheter, into a part of your abdomen, which is your peritoneum. Uh, the lining of your abdomen, again, peritoneum, acts as a fear and removes waste products from your blood. After a set period of time, 
the fluid with the filtered waste products flows out of your abdomen and in and is just uh is placed into a, a basically a, a a drain bag or a bucket or what whatever you have uh that it drains into uh, when you do your drain session. Uh, these treatments can be done at home, can be done at work or while traveling. Um, but yes, yeah, while traveling, if you you know RV a lot or uh, you know do uh, do a lot of traveling things that age, you can still do um, peritoneal cyclic dialysis. Um, I believe Jonathan uh, the trailer knows one who does uh, who travels while doing. Uh, their peritoneal dialysis. I, I don't know the name of of uh, heart, um, but um, they do do it on a daily basis, which is actually what to me. Um, but peritoneal dialysis is an option for everyone with kidney failure. You need manual uh, and ability to care for yourself at home, or you need a reliable caregiver. So your caregiver is. Uh, very important um and what we do as as dialysis patients uh because we need that help whether well, dialysis patient as well as um as well as uh transplant patients as well give me one second Um, so the next slide is reasons for starting uh, peritoneal dialysis. Uh, you need dialysis to be longer function well enough. Kidney damage generally progresses over a number of years as a result of long-term conditions, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, which is the two leading causes of uh, kidney failure. Um, kidney inflammation, glomerulonephritis, um, multiple cysts in the kidneys, known as uh, polycystic kidney disease, which is um, one of the, also one of the top reasons why people have kidney failure in the genetic. Um, go to the next slide. Try not to stay up here too long. Um, the benefits of peritoneal dialysis compared uh, with hemodialysis. Uh, the greater lifestyle flexibility and independence. Um, with peritoneal dialysis, you do this at night, so you pretty much have the day uh, to do whatever it is that you you know need to get done throughout the day. Uh, shopping, uh, you know, with the clothes shop, grocery shopping, um, anything like that, things to do around the house that you need to get done. Um, any of those things, it gives you a lot of independence and in, in being, again, like you said, being able to travel, uh, things of that nature uh, like that. Um, these can be uh, especially important if you work, travel, or live for a farmer from a hemodialysis center. Um, but the one thing that is also known is that not all hemodialysis centers um, have home uh programs in order for you to make that transition. So uh, sometimes you have to do some deep digging uh, to find a, a, a dialysis unit or hopefully your medical facility has that home hemo uh, program um, attached to their, their facilities in order for you to, to have that happen. Um, a less restricted diet, um, Yes and no. Uh, Lindsay's going to touch on on the diet side of that um, a little later on. Uh, I think right after me, actually. Um, peritoneal dialysis is done uh, more continuously than hemodialysis um, because uh, peritoneal dialysis is something that's done every night. 
uh, usually for about eight, nine, for some 10 hours, depending on your, your condition and functioning of your kidneys, if you have any functioning kidneys, um, resulting in less acclimation of potassium, sodium, and fluid. Um, that does not mean that you don't have to watch what you eat. You still have to, to pay attention to these things. Uh, this follows you uh, to have more flexible diet than you could have on hemodialysis. True, again, but still kind of pay attention to these things uh, that you're putting in your body. Um, longer lasting resilient function. People who use peritoneal dialysis by retain kidney function slightly longer than people who use hemodialysis. Um, I've heard this to be true by a number of nephrologists. Um, never really kind of seen it with patients um, in, in a difference. So I'll leave that uh, where it is. Um, let me see. Uh, factors consi to consider when deciding a type of dialysis. What's your kidney function? Uh, your overall health, your personal preferences, um, your uh, home situation, and then there's one more, uh, your lifestyle. So all that comes into play is very important, especially your home situation, uh, because the first thing that they want to see is if you have a room that's sterile enough to be able to provide and hold and sustain uh, peritoneal dialysis for you on the site. Um, sorry for that background noise. Um, as well as uh, manual dialysis as well. Mr. Cook touched on this earlier about being sterile uh, and things of that nature. It's very, it's a very important uh, component to uh, being on on home dialysis. Um, is your the nature of being sterile? Uh, your room or you know wherever you do your dialysis is clean consistently. Um, very, very important. Um, let's see, next slide. Reasons why PD would be for you. Uh, can't tolerate the rapid changes of fluid balance associated with hemodialysis. Uh, you may want to minimize the disruption of your daily activities. Again, like I said, it gives you a lot of independence uh, to be on home uh, dialysis or peritoneal cyclic dialysis. Uh, you want to work or travel more easily or at all, period. You know, a lot of people, some, most people can't really work uh, or anything like that while they're on uh, hemodialysis because it takes so much energy uh, out of the system where they can't really function too much. First thing they want to do when they get home is is eat and go to sleep or go straight to sleep. Um, so uh, have some residual kidney function. Again, like I said before, you know, hold on to, to that kidney function a little bit more um, doing uh, peritoneal dialysis and hemodialysis. Reason like PD might not be for you. Um, extensive surgical scars in your abdomen, uh, which means a lot of scar tissue uh, that goes with that that is involved in that. A lot of cutting in, in those areas, especially if you have it uh, more than once. Like myself, I actually had to have. Um, my catheter placed. This was uh, my third time. I, it was the first time I did PD. Um, it also was placed uh, the original time I was going to go back after um, I actually lost uh, lost that first kidney and was going to uh, make that transition from incident hemodialysis to uh, back to cyclic peritoneal dialysis, um, but could not do it at that time. So they had to take it out. And then it was placed again once everything was put back in place and was ready for me to make that transition. Uh, so it is a lot of scarring going on in there. They even mentioned it uh, recently going through um, appointments uh, for, you know, a uh, future transplant. Um, you see uh, a large area, a weakened abdominal muscle, a hernia, like, you know, Mr. Cook mentioned uh, a hernia earlier in, in his presentation. Uh, limited ability to take care of yourself or a lack of caregiving support. Again, like I mentioned before, caregiving is very important, uh, not only for us as, as dialysis patients, but you as a transplant patient as well. So if you have uh, caregiving uh, problems now as 
uh, being on on dialysis, then more than likely you know, have problems with being a transplant patient as well. So it's best to get those things uh, sorted out ahead of time. Um, inflammatory bowel disease or frequent uh, bouts of uh, diverticulitis. Uh, I've heard of a uh, number of stories about diverticulitis, and it's not something that I want to deal with. Um, I, you know, I barely want to deal with peritonitis. Um, and, and for anybody else that's on this call that's dealt with it, or any of the professionals that have had conversations, it's not a not a pretty sight to deal with uh, peritonitis. Uh, this is um, my last slide. So um, while you may be denied for a cycler PD, not manual. Uh, there are a number of reasons why that you can be uh, denied for this. Now, this is, is considered um, a mixture of bad and ugly. Um, you may not necessarily have uh, the the exact room that they are looking for for you to do manual, I mean, a uh, cycler peritoneal dialysis, um, where you need to have consistent, you know, space um, and be able to do these uh, constant um, cycles of, of dialysis at night, right? Again, it's the big thing about that is being still. Being still is very important um, and it is the number one thing on their list when it comes to uh, peritoneal dialysis. Now, um, the thing about beginning the okay for manual, um, which is, I mean, because you, hey, you could do this in the bathroom if you want to. You got to clean up bathroom and you, you are, um, what's the one I'm looking for? Um, and you can function in a space like that to where you make sure, you know, your, your catheter doesn't fall out your hand and bang the wall or bang the counter drop your your uh your mini caps and things of that nature like that then by all means you know if, if, if that's easy for you you can do it that way then they'll they'll give you an okay to, to do manual and that's what your order is manual bags as opposed to using a cycler um which, where you know you need more room to, to do a cycler um so uh thanks erica um so definitely uh and I, i'm actually i'm done um that is you know the good the bad the ugly hope it was informative to you all um eric if there's any questions i'll be more than happy to answer them thank you philip uh at at this moment there are no i don't see any questions in the chat but just a few points of clarification so it's possible to do both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis at home correct Yes, the, it is possible to do home uh, peritoneal and hemodialysis. It is a different uh, type of dialysis, um, and the machines work differently, but it is possible, yes. Okay, great. And with the peritoneal at home, is it the same situation with the number of boxes and the, the type of sterile environment? Is that all the same? is with hemo to put the word a lot of boxes with it yes um when it comes to a uh, number i am not uh quite sure um i only have done um peritoneal uh home peritoneal dialysis i did manual for a quick second but um when it comes to the boxes you can get them i don't know if this is the same thing john didn't touch on this but um, I know that you have them in, in time um, every week, every two weeks, uh, every month, uh, you know, uh, time ranges of, of that. Um, Alex, uh, which was on here, actually, I don't even know, is a, a current PD uh, patient as well. And he says he usually gets 30 to 40 boxes uh, in a month. Um, I actually get um about 25 i do mine every, i get mine about every two weeks um and but that also depends on uh because i'm usually pretty ahead of my, with my boxes and how i order them so 
Um, usually I'm a, a head of the game, so I usually have really enough for um, a month at, at kind of any time. Sometimes, um, you know, I might have been in a hospital or thing that I missed the date to order my boxes, so I still have enough to get to that next uh, shipment um, that I need to get to. Uh, so, so again, it can be so 20 to 25. If it's a, a normal time, it could be 10 to 15. Um, but like uh, Alex said, you know, generally 30 to 40 from in a month. It also depends on um, what your, uh, uh, what's I'm looking for? Um, what your uh, treatment is uh, through your dialysis as well. Uh, what kind of bags you use, how many bags you use, how many you use, or have, you know, uh, have to look at, at being taken on and, and things of that nature. So it's a number of things that go into that and how many boxes uh, you can get. So it varies. Uh, Jonathan, how many boxes did you normally get uh, when you did home hemo? Uh, my apologies. I should have clarified. So the first delivery was 74 boxes. Uh, once I got into a routine of ordering uh, every two weeks, I was getting somewhere around like 40 boxes. Okay. Hey, Jonathan, if you might correct me if I'm wrong, but did you do um, home hemo? Yes, sir. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. yeah with, with with PD, uh, to kind of piggyback off what Philip was saying, um, like I said, I get 30 to 40 boxes a month, and that's how my, my dialysis center kind of tells us we have to order them monthly, not every two weeks, just how it works. Um, but usually they tell us as well in our dialysis center to make sure you have more. So if power was to go out or something was to happen with the cycler issue, or if you have an issue with your cycler, have enough on hand for three days is what they tell us um, of manual bags. So you also have to make sure you have enough bags for manual in the event something wants to happen, you have a power outage, a bad storm, and you, and you can't you know do the recycler at night. That you then have to do your manual. So it's also important to make sure you have the manual as well, just because you just don't know what's going to happen with the cycler. That's actually a great point because that's something that you can't do on hemo. Mm, so interesting. If if the power goes out, you cannot do hemodialysis at home because you have to have electric to run the machine. But mm -hmm. those of you on peritoneal can do the manual exchanges. So right. that is something to keep in mind. Did you ever have any issues? If you don't mind me asking, did you have any issues when you did home hemo with having a power outage at all? Yeah, I covered that at the beginning. Uh, oh, I, oh, I did my first two weeks. I, I had like two uh, power outages. Uh, so that training, that training kicked right in. My wife was able to help me out with that and, and return my blood and all that. So good deal. Right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I missed no, it. Yeah, that's, okay. that's awesome. That's cool. No problem. Good to see you, by the way, man. Good to see you. <laughs> good to see you too, Alex. Yeah. Excellent. Wonderful conversation. I'm so excited to see. You. Welcome, Alex. This is your Thank first you. time on the screen. Welcome. Welcome. Alex will be joining us later. He's a panelist later on this in the uh, presentation. So in all of our presenters have talked so much about diet and the restrictions and how what you eat can be a, can be detrimental to your day and how you're going to behave or how you're going to to feel. So with us today we have Lindsay Ducharme. She's a dialysis nutrition. Lindsay, welcome. Lindsay is a registered dietitian and board certified renal nutrition specialist. She began working with dialysis patients seven years ago and grew to love helping others with kidney disease, improve their health through food. She started her own private practice in 2021, which focuses on helping those with early stage CKD maintain kidney function. Welcome to the stage, Lindsay. Thank you, Erica. So I'm going to share my screen. I have a presentation. And actually, you have to bring it in. So it when you click it, it comes up on my end. But uh, so can you, you see my slide? Uh, bring it in. Uh, I did recently see it, and it clicked off. Okay, can you see it now? Yeah, let me go back. No, nope. yeah, you might have to uh, bring it back. Let in. me restart it. There we go. 
How's that? Okay, hold on one second. Let me bring it in. Uh, hold on one second. Sorry, got it off. Okay. So. Okay, it should be there. All right. So it says it's sharing on my end. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yeah, I can see it. Can you all see it? Yeah, I see yeah. it. Yes, okay. I, see it. I see it too. Great. So my presentation is going to be on including more plants in your renal diet. And we're going to be debunking some renal diet myths. So just a disclaimer, this presentation is for educational purposes only. Each person has unique nutritional needs and should consult with their healthcare team for a specific guidance. So as um, Philip was mentioning, depending on what kind of dialysis you're doing, your needs are going to be different and it's going to be based on um, other conditions you may have. So here I have an image of the quote unquote old renal diet. So if you Google renal diet, this is pretty much what it's going to tell you to eat. So it's going to tell you to be including animal protein at every meal, especially chicken, white rice or white bread, small portions of low potassium fruits or vegetables. And here on the other side of the screen, we have the quote unquote new renal diet. Yeah. I'm sorry. Some reason is not is not changing on the oh. Our end. Oh, oh that's weird. Okay, so maybe I have to leave it like this. Like, okay. Can you see like um? Yes. Yeah, we can okay. see it now. I'll just yeah. go like that. So the new renal diet. So this is what research has shown us is actually appropriate for people on dialysis to have. So. It encourages more plant proteins, such as beans, legumes, nuts, fruits and vegetables, and it encourages whole grains. So pretend this picture is, um, this is a chickpea salad, and we can say that's a whole grain pita bread, and you have some fresh fruits and vegetables. So what, why am I talking about the importance of plants, plant foods? So Americans in general don't eat enough fruits and vegetables, and those on dialysis eat even less. So partly because of things they may be reading on the internet, maybe other people are telling them, oh, your potassium's high, you can't eat fruits and vegetables. Um, but unfortunately, that's not always the case. So there was a study that was done, and they surveyed 8,000 people on dialysis. And it showed that on average, they were consuming less than eight servings of fruits and vegetables per week. So that's about a little over one serving of fruit and vegetable per day. And then another study looked at low potassium diet handouts for people on dialysis. And it showed that they primarily restrict fruits and vegetables, while the least common restriction is ultra processed food. So we're going to go into the um, ultra ultra processed food in a little bit. But why is this a problem? So one of the top causes of death for those on dialysis is heart disease. So lower intakes of fruits, vegetables, and plant foods is associated with a higher risk of heart disease. So obviously we want people on dialysis, we want their hearts to be healthy, especially if they're going to go on to get a transplant. Oh, so because I'm not presenting this the right way. I kind of have to move this out of the way. Okay, so which sandwich filling is lower in phosphorus? So we have the peanut butter, and then we have two slices of deli turkey. So a lot of people tell me when they first start dialysis, they ask if they can have peanut butter because they read that you know it's high in phosphorus. But in reality, it's not. So two, two tablespoons of peanut butter, it's only 116 milligrams of phosphorus compared to the deli turkey that is 139 milligrams. So 
For plant proteins, your body only absorbs about 40%. That is because of the form of phosphorus in the plant foods. So in reality, you're only absorbing about 46 milligrams of phosphorus from the peanut butter. And this deli turkey, I have the ingredient list. This is um, a Jenny O low sodium turkey breast and it contains an additive in it. So your body absorbs 100% of the phosphorus from additives. So you're going to be absorbing all of this. And I do have a little um, disclaimer at the bottom. So food companies, they're not required to test for phosphorus. This is the amount based on the average phosphorus content of deli turkey. So I try to call Jenny O and actually ask them how much phosphorus is in their product. And they told me they don't know because they don't test it. So it can be really scary because this phosphorus amount could be higher. All right. So, so another quick little quiz. So which is lower in potassium? So we have one cup of black beans, or we have, again, the same two slices of deli turkey. And this was really shocking to me that this brand had 710 milligrams of potassium in only two slices of deli turkey. And again, that is because of this potassium additive. So one cup of black beans is a lot of beans in general, but if you cut that in half, and you're only getting about 330 milligrams of potassium, that is way less than the deli turkey. So I would say, yes, you can totally have beans on a renal diet. So as you may have guessed, the real problem is the packaged foods and the additives that are in them. So these food additives are used for a variety of reasons. They improve shelf life of the food, flavor, texture, the moisture of the product, so here I have some examples of potassium additives, so potassium phosphate, potassium chloride, potassium lactate, and some phosphorus additives are sodium phosphate, dicalcium phosphate, and phosphoric acid. So unfortunately, there are way more than this for additives, and there's also other sodium additives. So all of these additives, they're really easily absorbed into the body they can actually double to triple the amount of phosphorus or potassium content of the food. So I have some examples of some foods that commonly have these additives. So a lot of people on dialysis have been told if it's a clear drink, you can have it. So this is a flavored water. And as you can see, there are all kinds of potassium additives and they have the phosphoric acid in it. So it may not be the best choice. And over here, so even if you're having fresh meat, especially pork and chicken, they can sometimes um, be injected with different additives. Like this pork has been injected with potassium, sodium phosphate. So you really have to read the package of even your fresh meat to see if it says it's marinated with something or if it's enhanced with something. So it's really important to read the fine print. And then this is really shocking to me that one cup of this low sodium chicken noodle soup has 820 milligrams of potassium. So someone on dialysis, they're told to limit their potassium to 2000 milligrams a day. So if they ate one cup of soup, they're almost meeting half of their needs. So again, this is really misleading because it's, it's advertised as a low sodium product, which it is, but what the food companies do. So instead of using sodium chloride, they use potassium salts or potassium chloride. So this gives the flavor of salt, but yet it's going to be lower in sodium and it's going to be high in potassium. So again, if you look at this ingredient list, you're going to see all kinds of additives, the phosphate and then the potassium salts. So here are some healthy eating strategies for dialysis. So first and foremost, reducing the processed and packaged foods. So this doesn't mean you can't eat something if it's in a can or it's in a package. For instance, I personally prefer canned beans. I don't have the time to soak them 
And I love frozen vegetables because you don't have to worry about them going bad in the fridge or the freezer rather. So you always want to check your food labels, even if you think the food is safe, such as a package of food that is labeled low sodium. So to me, that's a red flag. That food may contain a, pa a potassium additive. And of course, your fresh meats, you want to check in beverages. So you can try replacing animal protein for plant protein. So instead of chicken salad, try a chickpea salad sandwich. And if you're having a burrito bowl, maybe try like pinto beans rather than ground beef. So you also want to choose plenty of lower potassium fruits and vegetables. I recommend aiming for at least one fr fruit or vegetable at every meal, and you want to include it at your snack if you can. So here I have some guidelines on what a serving is. So for a fruit, it could be one small or medium whole fruit, such as like an apple, or it could be half a cup of fresh or frozen fruit. So like maybe half a cup of blueberries or half a cup of pineapple. And for vegetables, half a cup of fresh or cooked vegetable is a serving. And if you're having something like raw, like lettuce or kale, it would be a one cup of the raw leafy greens. But of course, if the greens are cooked, it's going to be the half a cup is the serving. So last step, you always want to know what foods are high in potassium. So even if you're doing more plant-based, it's not a good idea to just go out and eat five bananas. Let's still, you know, I would err on the side of caution. So always ask your dietitian how to safely include the higher potassium foods into your diet. All right, and to summarize, yes, you can safely eat plant protein, fruit, vegetables, and other plant foods if you are on dialysis. Food additives significantly increase phosphorus and potassium content in foods, and they're likely a major culprit of high potassium and phosphorus. And we really need to update educational materials to reflect um, these food additives and checking processed foods. And of course, work with your renal dietitian to help include your favorite plant foods into your diet. So lastly, um, if anyone has any questions or would like a copy of my slides, feel free to reach out to me. You can message me on Facebook at Lindsay Nutrition or on Instagram. And these are the references that I used for my, for my slides. Okay. Thank you so much, Lindsay. That was very informative. I feel like now I've learned so much as well. Uh, so, yeah. so tell us real quick before we move on to Safaro's next presentation, how does someone ease into this diet? If, they, if they've been eating all these preservatives and all of these additives with all of this food, how, when they first get the news that they need to go on dialysis, how do they ease into this diet? Or what are some small changes they can make? So I definitely recommend... Um, Starting slow, I usually have people look at the beverages first because that can make such a big difference. Like if people are drinking Coke or if they're drinking like vitamin waters that have a lot of these additives, that is something some people can change more easily. And I just try and focus on foods they can have and foods they like and just trying to work with them to just make them make their choices a little bit healthier. So it definitely it it's better to do things gradually rather than jumping into a whole new diet. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Again, if anyone has questions about her presentation, I'm sure uh, get in touch here and we'll send out your slides to her so she can continue yeah. to help educate and give any information you need about your diet. So next we're gonna go back. Lindsay, I, 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 Lizzie, I had a question. Sorry, no, sorry, Eric. I, I had no. a question. Lizzie, do you recommend anybody with CK, uh, CDK as uh, chronic kidney disease, should they become vegan? And what's your thoughts on eggs? That's what I wanted to ask you. So plant-based diets definitely help um, preserve your kidney function, but I definitely don't think that people need to go full vegan just because, I mean, I grew up eating meat and I, I do eat a lot of plant-based foods, but I feel like when people try to go full vegan and they're not fully 
ready to, they're going to just, um, it's just hard. You just may end up like falling off the rail and then not being able to stick with it. So I just prefer like more sustainable changes. Um, and eggs, so there are definitely a lot of benefits for eggs. Um, so, I mean, it really depends on someone's protein needs, but if someone is on is trying to preserve their kidney function, if they have CKD, um, I feel like there are benefits to the healthy fats and the vitamins in eggs, like the choline, because um, that's not found in a lot of different foods. So I think they can be part of a healthy diet for CKD and definitely for dialysis. But you, but you also, you recommend though, no meat, no red meat at all, like stay away from the period. I tell people, you know, people that are really big meat and potatoes people, I just say, you know, try and limit the red meat to once a week and see how you do. Cause I feel like once they get used to eating other foods, they kind of stop missing it as much. And then maybe they feel like, oh, I can totally do this. I can just have it once a week and I'm satisfied. What's your thoughts on people with kidneys or kidney transplant recipients with meat and their diet? Like, cause a lot of times people who have kidney transplants feel like they can just go back to eating what they want. And I tell them still, you know, you still want to watch it a little bit and everything because you know, you still, things can still happen. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Um, they definitely don't need to be as strict, but they definitely want to be following just a general healthy diet, um, especially for their heart health. Um, yeah, so I definitely agree with you on that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Excellent question, Stefaro. And I think that's a, that's a great segue because, you know, eating and nutrition is so important to maintain your physical, ex your physical activity. And I'm thinking once on dialysis, that's probably the hardest thing to maintain because you, the, one of the things you need the most and probably one of the hardest things to maintain. And we're going to welcome Tafaro back to the stage to talk about physical activity. And I'll take this moment to introduce him as I forgot uh, when he did his first presentation. Tafaro Cook is a two-time kidney transplant survivor who thrived on dialysis for over a decade. While on dialysis, he owned a fitness studio where he personally trained and operated his business. Tafaro started exercise programs in the dialysis unit to help patients stay healthy while waiting on a life-saving organ. He is now the founder of Kidney Care Coaches, where they coach people with stages three to five kidney disease. Tafaro is married and a father of two. He enjoys exercising, traveling, reading, and building classic cars. Tafaro, welcome to the stage. The mic is yours. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Um, I don't have any slides, anything. I just wanted to talk about, you know, exercise with uh, while you're on dialysis. And when I say exercise, when, when you're on dialysis, I'm not talking about anything strenuous. I'm talking about like, first things first, always ask your doctor and get a recommendation to see what your doctor says. If he says it's okay to do a little bit of exercise and things like that, then go for it. And some of the things I tell people, because, you know, when you're on dialysis, it might use a lot of times the people are a little bit older and things like that. And I tell them, start with just walking. You know, if you can just walk um, around the block, uh, walk your dog, walk, you know, a pet, walk with a friend, things like that. You can even also, you know, walk around the house if it's cold outside, you know, walk up and down the steps and things like that. You always want to get your body moving and get the blood going because a lot of times when you're on dialysis, a lot of people sit sedentary and they don't do anything. And what can happen when you're sedentary, you know, the bones can get weak because, you know, even on dialysis, you know, you have a challenge where the bones can get weak and your muscles can, can just atrophy, you know, shrinkage of the muscles. So again, you know, you want to start walking. If that's not too hard, you know, you might want to get some bands, do some exercises with some bands and things like that. You can also use a uh, small dumbbells like five to ten pounds i recommend people doing things like that some of the great exercises you can do are um again walking um squatting with your uh, own body weight you know you can do push-ups you can do push-ups off your knees things like that because you still want to give your body some resistance exercises because you want to keep your body as strong as possible especially if you're you know waiting for a kidney transplant 
You know, a lot of times when you go get a kidney transplant, the first thing they do is do a stress test with your heart to see if you're able to be able to get a transplant. And by you walking and doing things like that, that's going to keep your heart going good. And that's a big challenge for a lot of times when people on dialysis. Another challenge I see with people are, you know, they feel tired all the time because of dialysis. Well, if you exercise, it will give you your energy back. You know, also by exercising and moving the body, you create dopamine in the body. And, you, you know, you get that euphoria where you start feeling good about yourself. And it also gives you, um, you know, exercise gives you your control back. A lot of times on dialysis, we see people, you know, they, someone's always telling them something to do. Take this medication, you know, do your dialysis like this, all kinds of stuff. And you seem like, you feel like you're, you don't have any control of who you are. And by exercising, you get a little control back. You know, you start taking your control back. Like, okay, I'm going to start, you know, exercising. I'm going to start getting my control back of who I am. You know, I'm not telling you to be a workout crazy maniac like I was when I was on dialysis. You know, I still worked out hard as, you know, the regular dudes and stuff. But I'm not telling you to do that. But a little couple of dumbbells with some, you know, some shoulder presses, you know, squats, uh, you know, without any weights. Even the air punches where you're just punching the air, you know, walking up and down the steps, all of these things would be so much, so beneficial for your body. A lot of times when on dialysis, um, you you lose your functionality and that means your balance, your stability and things like that. And by you walking and you even the slight jog, if possible, you know, do these things and, and keep the body active. You know, and that's one thing I can say. I don't want to, you know, go into too much detail because of time restraints and things like that. But keep your body active. It'll help with the blood flow in your body, the circulation. And it'll also help you with your mind because a lot of times when you're on dialysis, we get a lot of brain fall, you know, because the toxins can build up all throughout the body and it can build up in the brain also. So by you exercising and you moving your body, you keep yourself, you know, your, your, your cognitive mind, you keep everything kind of fresh and things like that. So that's just a couple of tips I wanted to give people about exercising. If you really wanted to go into details and give you a plan to exercise, you can hit me up at kidneycarecoaches.com because all the people I work with, I definitely create a workout plan for them that they're going to do some type of exercise. And I have people who are 65 to 70 years old, and I still create a, a little program for them to exercise, even amputees, I still create a small little exercise problem program for them. And again, it's good for your it's good for your blood pressure, and it's also good for, it's also good for your if you have diabetes, those things like that. So I just wanted to keep that brief. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kefaro. And and that goes for everyone. I mean, everyone every single day. The simplest thing we can do is to walk just get up and just start walking around your house you know there are so many devices now where you can check track yourself and challenge yourself each day to do more and more so thank you Tafaro, for that and let's keep the program moving now we've heard about nutrition and we've heard about physical activity we have dr sharika brookins with us dr brookins welcome to the stage Dr. Brookins is a board certified nephrologist and internist licensed in Georgia. Dr. Brookins graduated from Meharry Medical College with a doctorate of medicine. She went on to complete her internal medicine residency training in her hometown at UF Health Jacksonville. Please kindly, I'll ask all panelists to mute your mics, please. Thank you. After completing her nephrology fellowship training at Vanderbilt University, she relocated to Augusta, Georgia. She is devoted to community service by educating and empowering others about kidney disease, nutrition, transplantation, and health disparities. Dr. Brookins is the founder and CEO of Remote Renal Care, a telehealth kidney practice providing care to rural Georgia. Dr. Brookins is a published author in medical scientific journals and digital media and a member of leading medical societies. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Brookins. The stage is yours. Hi, Erica. Thank you. Thank you for having me, everyone. And it, it's an honor to be on this panel tonight. So 
I am going to, I do have a presentation. So let's see. All right, can everyone can see that? Yeah, hold on one second. You know, I really, I, I didn't know which order we were gonna go in, like if it was me and then the personal stories, but I will say this order is perfect because you know, getting to hear from Jonathan's story to Philip's story and to Faro's story, um, it's kind of going to play into um, these slides on what have we seen with the progression of the different types of dialysis over time. So if you can see my presentation, just let me know if it's like a full presentation or not. We're good, Doctor. Yeah, we, uh, we can see the slides, yeah. It's not oh, like so full screen, but. Okay. Sounds like the same issue Lindsay had then. All right. So yeah. um, again, thank you, Erica. I'm Dr. Brookins and I am again, excited to be here on this panel. And so the good, the bad and the ugly, I'm going to break my, and then I'm also going to talk about how to get a transplant. So for those viewers who are on dialysis, and haven't signed up for a transplant, or if you have signed up, but you're kind of still in the process, I'm gonna address that process as well. So I'm gonna start with showing you, and all of my slides come from USRDS. It's the reference for these slides. And this is the most updated report, which is the 2020 report. And it goes from 2000 to 2018. Can you see my cursor? Okay. Yes. Um, yes we can see. Oh, perfect. All right. Yes. So as you can see up here is in center hemo. So this is what Tafaro went over with us. And this is the modality that he chose or the modality that he was on. And when I say modality, I am speaking of the mode or the type of dialysis. And the main three types we've discussed tonight are going to be home hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and in center dialysis. And Jonathan did make mention in the, in the comments, there is a fourth type of dialysis, which is called nocturnal dialysis. So it's pretty much in center, but it's at night. So over the years, you can see that the most common form of hemodialysis is in center. And when you come down here, home hemodialysis is actually the least utilized form of dialysis. And then there's peritoneal. And we can also see that over time, there has been a, a slight increase in peritoneal, which is actually where the organization is trending towards getting more um, kidney disease patients on home dialysis. And so here I wanted to show also the difference between um, the race. So if you see, we have white, we have black, African-American, American Indian, Asian, and native Hawaiian. Again, the most common is in center hemodialysis, and but you will notice that some of the groups are a little bit more when it comes to the utilization of in center hemodialysis, whereas the gray is peritoneal. And you can see, although they do look fairly similar, the Asian uh, community generally are higher in peritoneal dialysis as well as the white community. And then up here, you have... Uh, transplants are considered in this uh, graph as well. And this, I wanted to include this to highlight the importance of knowing what your modality is. And this goes back to Jonathan's story, right? In which he, it, you know, it was an unfortunate situation in which when he felt sick, it was when he had to start dialysis. So therefore, he only had the option that was him. So what this graph is showing, these are individuals who their relationship they had before dialysis care. So this column is representing those who only may have been under the care of a nephrologist for six months, six to 12 months, over 12 months and not at all. So this, you know, I don't know, Jonathan, if you mentioned that you, you were in nephrology care, but you can see um, 
here, we have a lot more of those who started under 5% for their GFR. Most of the time, we're recommending you start dialysis when your GFR is under 10. But of course, that is based on your symptoms technically when you should start dialysis. And on average, it's going to be between 5 to 9%, which is the red. And this green in which people started above 15% was actually more of the pediatric population. And again, this represents the start of dialysis. Where was their GFR according to race? So the most important ones to look at are the less than 5%. Um, we can see that we had more commonly amongst Blacks starting dialysis for the first time, more so when their uh, GFR is less than 5 But the most common was between 5 to 9%. So I stress these slides to say, Know your mode of modality, your choice in which you desire well before you get to 10% and even 15%. Ideally, that discussion should be finalized when you're in your fourth stage. That's generally when, you know, I really try and make sure my patients have a, a pinpoint understanding of what their mode of modality is. And now here's the vascular access. So again, speaking to catheter first with Jonathan's story starting on hemo with a catheter, this is, this is a group of individuals who likely, if they don't have nephrology care, they're going to start with a catheter. Now, the best is a fistula. So we have this saying fistula first, that's ideal, um, because the studies just show that there was a better performance in uh, mortality, meaning um, death rate, as well as complications when you have a fistula versus a catheter is the least recommend it. However, I will say if you do have to have a catheter, just at least not for a long term is what's recommended. So for individuals who had good nephrology follow up care over 12 months, they were most likely to have a fistula. So now when you're on dialysis and your doctor sees you every week, or if not once a month, and then they may have a nurse practitioner or PA that follows you once a week, there are certain values that we really look at and, you know, we really hone in on, you know, out of all of the functions that the kidney provides, there are certain ones that we know through studies and just through longevity studies that um, can affect the outcome of the individual. So one that's important is albumin. So this column on the left is those of, with hemodialysis and the one on the right is peritoneal dialysis. So I show this slide because I want to show you as a, a pro versus a con. So in peritoneal dialysis, we tend to run more so into problems where the albumin is under ideal. And that's this blue area. You see the blue area is more on the peritoneal side than on the hemo side. We tend to see more of a lower albumin when someone is on peritoneal dialysis. But the ideal value is in this red area. So albumin is important uh, because it's, it's a marker of malnutrition as well as of healing. So like when Tafaro spoke about multiple surgeries on his fistulas, you know, you want to have a good, robust, ideal albumin to help to, to know and have a better assurance that you will have good healing from um, any surgical procedures. And so hemoglobin is the next one. Generally, you know, I show this slide to show there's no huge difference. There's no pro or um, con to which modality you choose, peritoneal versus hemodialysis. The ideal areas that we want patients hemoglobin to be is between 10 to 11, and that's this gray area. I did want to present this slide because generally if that hemoglobin starts to run into this blue area, which is less than the dark blue is less than nine. If you run into hemoglobins of sevens or hemoglobins of sixes, then you will probably encounter more blood transfusions. And again, if your goal is to get a transplant, we want to reduce those because blood transfusions can um, affect your immune profile. So the ideal level for hemoglobin is in this gray. There's no um, pro versus con between the modalities of hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. Next is calcium. So calcium is important um, because we know not only for bone health, but also for cardiovascular health. And you can see here the difference. 
hemodialysis on the left and peritoneal on the right, there's no big difference in which one is better than the next. Phosphorus is the same as calcium, um, benefits of bone health and vascular health. Um, and again, they're, they're pretty similar when it comes between the modalities. And the ideal range here, we want to see people in the red. So like a three and a half to four and a half level on your phosphorus. And this is on FOSS binders. So I wanted to show this because I don't know if any of you have ever heard of them, but we have iron-based phosphorus binders. That's in this green region. So lanthanum is a, is a much older FOSS binder. And as you can see, this gray area is starting to phase out because we're tending to use less of that and more of the savellamer or rimbella is the other name, which is in the red and even using the green. So if you're someone who suffers with anemia problems and you take iron pills or you're getting iron infusions, but you also have phosphorus problems, then an iron-based phos binder has been um, an option um, over the past um, five or so years. And you can see that the calcium-based ones are just trending off slowly as the iron-based are trending upward. And then this speaks back to the transfusions. So this dark blue area shows people over the course of a decade um, having one blood transfusion versus the green. You know, we really, really want to avoid multiple transfusions, especially if, if the goal is ultimately a transplant. So the do's of dialysis versus the don'ts of dialysis, I do want to stress one of the number one do's is to discuss with your nephrologist and to choose your ideal type of dialysis. So peritoneal, home dialysis, there are a variety, right? There's manual and there's a cycler and then there's nocturnal, there's, there's nocturnal um, hemo and then there's in-center hemo and then there is home hemo. But the best type is going to be what best fits your lifestyle, which was already stressed tonight, which is why I'm glad that everyone shared their perspective of the different types of dialysis, because you can see all these men, you know, having different lifestyles and different um, types of modalities suiting them. So it's not our decision as your nephrologist. It, it, it should not be our decision as your nephrologist. We can, of course, only advise, like, for instance, I will say, if I had someone who wanted to do peritoneal, um, but their existing kidney function was not that great, they possibly would have a hard time keeping, keeping a good adequacy. So I would probably advise that they do hemodialysis. But again, it's, it's ultimately, it is your choice. Um, the don'ts, do not wait until your GFR is less than 10% to decide on the type of access you want and the type of dialysis you want. Um, it was stressed earlier, develop a relationship with your staff, like they're like your family. You're going to see them, you know, those days, if not monthly for our home dialysis patients and maybe even once a week. But you're going to see them thrice weekly if you're on hemodialysis and some people have to go four days a week. Do um, do don't believe that you don't have a say in your treatment plan because you do. Do minimize your excessive weight gain between your sessions. And Tafaro spoke on this earlier because the more weight gain you come in, you know, to, to prevent from compounding weight after weight over sessions, we do our best to get that off. But that is stressing you in your heart every time. And we know that there's an ideal goal, there's an ideal range at which that fluid should be pulled off per hour. And if you exceed that, it's just increasing the chances for issues every session. So for that reason, minimize skipping your dialysis before and after the weekends, because I mean, hey, if, if you're going to engage in a lot more fluid intake, you could run into that issue. Do consider nocturnal in center. Um, I have patients who continue to work, and so it's ideal for them to do nocturnal in center. And do consider fistula first, uh, versus a catheter, definitely for long-term duration. So next, I'm going to go into transplant. And so this is just to show about hospitalizations. And I wanted to include this because ideally, the ultimate goal is to have everyone transplanted. 
Lord knows that's my goal. So if you look here, the most com the the modality that's most likely to be admitted for hospitalizations are going to be those on hemodialysis and uh, peritoneal dialysis, just a little bit less, but transplant patients have a much better outcome of not having so many hospitalizations. This is, um, I wanted, I really wanted to include this because I've seen only because I may have acquired someone who had no idea they were inactive on the list. So if you, once you get on a transplant list, you should be evaluated at least once a year. You need to make sure you know your status. Am I active? Never assume that you are still active because you don't want anything to possibly throw you off the list and you're not. So do understand that there are people who are inactive on the transplant list. However, you may potentially be able to fix to fix the problem and get back on the list. And this is about blood type. So blood type versus the wait time. I wanted to include this slide because I do notice that a lot of the kidney warriors, when they're um, doing a great job at presenting their case on social media and they're saying what their blood type is, um, I just wanted to present this because just know that there are different wait times based on your blood type. The longest wait time is the blood type B followed shortly after the blood type O with the type AB having less time to wait. Now, I will say blood type B is known to be a common blood type of Blacks and only certain centers do it, but there is a, there is a way in which black, uh, B blood type patients or recipients can receive an A blood type. That's called, the procedure is called an A2 to B. Again, only certain procedures perform this. Uh, where I trained, we did do this procedure. And the ultimate goal was to pretty much try and reduce that disparity of African-Americans that were on the wait list. But again, it's not done everywhere. And this is just to show what we all know, that we need more living donors uh, that of our donors, definitely deceased donors um, outrank what we have for living donors. And that's a whole nother presentation on why. And then lastly, this shows the benefits of getting a living donor kidney. So this graph up here on the top left, it the top line is a living donor versus a deceased donor kidney. It's a blue line at a one year survival. They're very similar. The living donor is 97% and the deceased is 93%. But over the course of time, and once you get to 10 years, you see how those lines separate to where the deceased donor drops to almost 50%, whereas the living donor is at 65%. So the other thing we do know is that it is definitely of a greater benefit to receive a living donor kidney. So the do's and don'ts of a transplant, definitely a do is going to be to ask about it before you get to 20%. Why 20%? Because 20% is what they say is the point where you can get put on the transplant list. But I always encourage you to have that discussion prior to that. So if your doctor never brings it up, it needs to be brought up. Can it still be brought up while you're on dialysis? Yes, it can. You can... Um, undergo an evaluation for a transplant at any phase um, of your of your journey. Do um, one of the don'ts: do not think that you don't qualify, even if you may think something happened years ago, or oh my chest aches every once in a while. Whatever it is, just try. Never think that you don't qualify. Another do, of course, because I do have a virtual practice, but I also saw the benefit of it, especially during the pandemic, to consider virtual evaluations, which means COVID will not stop this show. You can still have an evaluation um, for a kidney transplant. And actually, in 2021, we transplanted the most kidneys ever in history. So COVID did not stop uh, kidney transplantations. So a don't, do not delay your evaluation because of any assumptions. I do strongly encourage vaccinations, and that's mainly because you want to minimize as much as possible any potential changes in your immunity, which goes to the next don't. 
So decrease your exposure of chances to change your immunity. And do ask for donor support from family, friends, and strangers. Like your, your live donors, your living donors don't always have to be family. It could be friends and strangers, which is what I love about social media and that people can share their stories of how they've received their living donors from, from, from all over. And if you're listed at one center, I do encourage you to list at at least two to three. And lastly, do not assume that you are active. Like you want to know, you want to have in your hand and know I am active. So thank you all. Here's a link. Uh, we're going to share it somehow, but I created um, some five steps to getting your transplant evaluation process um, rolling. And so either if you're in the process already and you're not sure what's next, these little these, this guy will help you to see what's next. Or if you are hesitant or ready to start, it'll just give you a little layout of, um, of what, what to expect. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Brookins. Very informative. I had one follow-up question for you, if I may. Of so course. How is, it, how is it that someone can go from being active to inactive without knowing it? How does that happen and how does someone prevent that? So if it happens, it's definitely a ball being dropped because there should be two people specifically that should notify, notify you of any changes in your status. And that's going to be your transplant coordinator and your nephrologist. So if ever you surprisingly find out, um, well, oh, I'm not active anymore, then the, the problem lies on either one of them. And I included that because I inherited a patient and, you know, we had our visit. This was like last year. And we had our visit and he wanted to speak about the update on his evaluation process. And so when I spoke with the transplant coordinator, it was like, oh no, he has to start all over again. And I'm like, okay, well, was no one gonna tell him that he had to start all over again? Mm -hmm. And it was of course the, so he should have received a letter, not only from the transplant center. So that means three people. He should have received a letter from the transplant center, but the nephrologist who was taking care of him prior to me should have notified him of that. So of course, you know, now we have to start this process all over again. Like imagine just how frustrating it is, but it is possible. It's possible to become inactive and not know it. That's very, that's, I can't imagine having that happen. So the checks and balances, who's responsible? The, this is the point where the patient needs to, needs to be their own best advocate and step up and right. be checking and making sure and following up. And, and that's it. Every single, how, how, is, how are they to do that? Are they supposed to be calling their nephrologist weekly, monthly? Who are they calling and how often and how frequent should they be following up so this ball isn't dropped? So generally, you're going to require blood tests anyway, because we're tracking your immunity over time while you're sitting on the wait list. And it's during those visits that you can get an update. You can ask for an update, right? Mm -hmm. Or you're definitely going to sit down with your nephrologist. And, and my thing is, if they don't give it to you, you ask them for it. Mm -hmm. But the hard part, the hard part about all of this, right, this is just so much information is knowing what to ask, which is why I have that checklist, because then you'll be able to see and say, OK, well, I know they should be doing this next or they should be asking me this next or this is what I can anticipate. So the hard part is knowing what to ask. But there mm -hmm. there are checks and balances. And unfortunately, sometimes things happen. It is rare, though, I will say it doesn't happen a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Oh, please, you were, you were saying? I said, but one time is one too many. I agree. Yes. I agree. And I, I think um, before we move on to Faro, uh, let's open up for questions briefly. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I have a, I have, yeah, I have a question. Um, Dr. Brooker, you talked about, you know, um, <clears throat> African-Americans being uh, mostly B 
and you guys changing it over. How did that process work where you can give a, a person a via transplant with another blood type? So what we do there is, so the A blood type, there's like an, there's like a subset. There's like an A1 and like an A2, right? And so that's why specifically the procedure is called A2 to B. And so that number, that A2 value is measured to see, well, what's the percentage of this B blood type that they would have to react to that A2? And remember, and I watched your video. So remember that plasma exchange that you went through? That's the procedure that mm -hmm. we do. We do that and we give big guns immunosuppressants. We do, we do rounds of that. And remember how they were measuring your levels, right? Yeah. They weren't doing the same thing, but um, after the procedures, the goal is to see those titers drop. So now when you give that patient who has a B blood type, they're not going to reject the A that's there. And so the goal is to at least allow, you know, some sort of reduction or improvement in the wait list for um, African Americans. And, and, and thank you for asking, answering that because I didn't, I never heard of that. Another question I have for you is, um, you, you talked about um, <clears throat> blood, um, blood, um, I think it was called uh, blood. Um, what's it called when you get a blood? Um, it, it, a blood transfusion? Yeah, blood transfusion. I lost my chain of, train of thought. So with the blood transfusions and you get those, does your antigens go up higher? And that could be the problem because you're getting it from somebody else? And, and that's the thing. Before you get blood, you have to get a cross match. But it's okay. there are still other factors that are within that blood that's foreign to you that could now introduce a new and it may not it may not harm you but who's to say that new kidney you're going to get is now probably not going to fare well with um that's like when moms when we have babies we're introducing new um immune cells to our baby and so again you're getting blood from someone else it's potentially introducing um some some new immune system things to you and and you and it's not that it will harm you but it's just it reduces the the chances of you getting that a new kidney and not having a problem i got you okay thank you for answering that question i appreciate it you're welcome thank you so much tafaro for all of your excellent questions well i see now that our patient panelists have been coming into the room into the space so i'd love to begin to move on to them um, and respect their time as well. Our panel, our patient panel is going to be led by the Kidney Trails team, Anthony and Dwellen. Welcome back. Is Dwellen with us? Well, I see Anthony. No, uh, Anthony's not going to be able to join us. Uh, real quick, Dwellen. Uh, Erica, uh, we're going to take a, a no, second Dwell, break. Dwellen is not going to be able to um, with the Anthony. Yeah, yeah, Anthony's here, Dwellen is not. Um, okay. But we're going to take a, a real, real quick second uh, break uh, to show a video. Hi, everyone. I'm Camille Cook, the family nurse practitioner, the creator, the developer, the chef, and the cook of crack. Well, creamy crack the addictive all natural body cream. I have a background in dermatology and cosmetic surgery, and I created a 98% organic and a 2% all natural body cream in 2011 for both my son and husband. My son who suffered from the irritating symptoms of eczema and my husband who was a two-time kidney transplant survivor and who was on kidney dialysis for over 10 years. They both suffered from the dry, itchy, scaly, and flaky skin. And as a mom and a wife, and with a background in dermatology as a nurse practitioner, I couldn't stand back and see them suffer any longer. So I got into the kitchen and started cooking crack. Well, creamy crack again. 
the All Natural Body Cream. It moisturizes, it replenishes, it restores, it heals and protects your largest organ. You got it, your skin. I have been able to make such a difference in the lives of those people who suffer from the irritating symptoms of being on kidney dialysis or who are awaiting a kidney transplant and also for those who suffer from eczema. Those people or individuals have suffered way too long and tried too many things to help their skin come back to life. I am so honored and grateful for you to try this all natural body cream. Again, that's going to help you look and feel better with your skin. Creamy Crack can be found on all social media platforms at Creamy Crack Body Cream or can be purchased at CreamyCrackBodyCream.com. I look forward to serving you, sharing with you, and making an impact in your life. I hope you'll go out and try Creamy Crack, the addictive all natural body cream. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Cook, for that wonderful uh, commercial. Uh, so back to it, uh, Eric was getting a patient panel uh, led by uh, Mr. Anthony Reed, uh, CEO and founder of Kidney Trails. Uh, so Eric, could go ahead and take it away and, and into our uh, next segment. Thank you, PJ. So we're going to get started with our patient panel. We have several patients here that are going to share their stories, and that panel is going to be led by Anthony Reed, as Philip just mentioned. Anthony is um, a former dialysis patient, now living with a kidney transplant. Anthony knows what it takes to not only live with kidney disease, but to live beyond kidney disease. He has shared his stories and lessons he has learned on a nationwide level. You can explore Anthony's journey or read about the lessons he has experienced that can help your journey on kidneytrails.com. Anthony, welcome to the stage. Thank you, it's good to be here. Thank you very much. And with that, Anthony is going to be leading our patient panel. Awesome, I appreciate it. It's good to be here, everyone. And looking forward to a great panel and to have a great conversation with all of the uh, patients that are here with us. How are y'all doing today? Doing good, doing great. Glad to be here. <laughs> well, we're grateful to be here too, but y'all have a, each one of y'all have very interesting stories. And I think that's something that the audience would like to hear about. So, um, if we could, Alex, you want to start out with sharing a little bit about your journey? I think you're muted. Who did he say? Did he say me? No, Alex. Uh, Alex. Oh, okay. Can you all hear me now? Go ahead, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. So, hey, everybody. My name is Alex Berrios. Uh, I reside in Louisville, Kentucky, um, and I am a one-time kidney transplant recipient. Uh, I've worked in the kidney space probably on and off for the last 10 years um, in a variety of myriad of different ways. Um, but my story is more or less, uh, when I was in my 20s, uh, I came home from, uh, I, I was sick one day and thought I was just had the flu or some food poisoning or something I had eaten. 
I uh, went to a local doctor's, went to a local into uh, like local clinic, and saw that my blood pressure was super elevated at like 230 or 180 or something crazy, some crazy number. And they uh, immediately gave me some Norvask and tried to put me down, you know, in a low light. Thought I was gonna have a stroke right there, right then and there. Uh, I then was moved after not being able to get the blood pressure down to the emergency room uh, for two days. They ran a boatload of tests. Um, found out I was only born with one kidney. Uh, that one kidney ultimately just had failed. Uh, still at that point, didn't know what caused it to fail. They thought I had glomerular nephritis. Um, so uh, my first go around, I uh, had the opportunity to do home uh, um, and center hemodialysis. I did that for about 18 months. Um, so I was one of those kind of patients that kind of crashed into dialysis. Um, so I didn't have a chance, like Doctor, um, like the doctor was talking about earlier, about um, being able to warrant, you know, to, to look at the percentage of my, uh, my GFR. I was probably so far gone that you know I had to go on the dialysis like immediately. Uh, so I did the dialysis for 18 months. Was fortunate enough to get a kidney transplant from a lady I went to church with um, after 18 months. So uh, it. Lasted for 13 years, so pretty good run, uh, 13 years, I think. Uh, and in July of 2020, it decided to finally kind of kind of hit the bit and uh, failed. So I had to go back. On, I'm back on dialysis currently. Um, this time around, I did about six weeks of uh, in-center hemodialysis and then talked to my nephrologist and was like, let's get ready. Let's do either home hemo or PD. Uh, and he said, you'd be a great candidate for PD. So uh, I've done. I've been doing peritoneal dialysis now for almost two years, um, been a year and a half or so, year and change. Um, and so I've been doing peritoneal dialysis, and I'm looking for a kidney. Um, and I've had two bouts of peritonitis in the in the, in the time I've had uh, my peer, my PD. One I think came from COVID. I got. I unfortunately had gotten COVID back in December, and there's been a conversation, some data that has been out there. That has said that sometimes people with COVID, uh, the peritonitis can sometimes happen. Um, there was no definitive, um, no definitive like decision that it was COVID that caused the peritonitis, but it's 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 likely. Uh, at least that's from my dialysis nurse. Um, what else do I have? Um, I like I said, I work in the space in the kidney space. I've done a lot of education. I've been I've been a patient advocate um, in the transplant world. Uh, working for the University of Kentucky for two, about two years, traveling all over the all over the counties of Kentucky and the regions, talking about transplant, the positive, the positive outlook on transplant, helping patients kind of understand what to do with transplantation and how to navigate those waters and kind of be the conduit between the dialysis center of the patient and the transplant center. Um, and that was great work, being able to kind of walk, walk and walk around and just talk to patients at all levels, you know, from anywhere. It was mainly adults. There weren't many pediatric, but um, it was still wonderful to kind of talk to those patients anyways. And kind of they, my eyes got wide open because there were a lot of patients I talked to in some rural parts of Kentucky who who were like who cared just about wanting to be on dialysis. And that was like their lot in life. And they didn't want to even get a transplant. They could have been in their 30s or 40s and they just felt comfortable getting staying on Dallas for the rest of their life, um, which was discouraging. Um, I currently work for a company called Cricket Health. Uh, I work from home. It's a wellness program that's a kidney wellness program that's based um, out of San Francisco. We talk, and we talk to patients that are in California and Texas and help them to kind of look at kidney disease from a preventative aspect where they get a care team of a nurse, a social worker, a dietitian, or a pharmacist. It's a telephonic and web-based program. And my job is in operations is to talk with them and help them enroll in the program. And of course, share my story with them if if they are kidney patients to kind of let them know the importance and the ideal of, um, of working there. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, looking forward to having more conversation with everybody about kind of their, their stories and what you know we can do to better kind of help people understand dialysis and just all the different modalities. Thank you. And I'm you know, ready to hear everybody else's stories. Awesome, we appreciate that. And I apologize, it looks like I have a weak signal. <laughs> but uh, let's move on. Uh, let's talk. Art, Art of Aries, is that right? 
Is that how you pronounce your name? Um, Artavius. Artavius. Okay, I apologize. <laughs> You're fine. If you want to share a little bit, that'd be great. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Artavius VZ. I am here in Memphis, Tennessee, and right now I am a kidney transplant of this year, July 15th, will be 17 years post-kidney transplant. Um, I was diagnosed with kidney disease at the age of three. Um, it was hereditary from my mom with nephritis as well. And um, I went on dialysis for 18 months at the age of 13. And it was definitely a traumatic experience, as we all know. Um, but for me, I was 13, so definitely going through the stages of puberty and trying to figure out who I am and what I want to do, especially going into high school, was definitely a lot for a teenager. But I went through that. Um, my dad was my living donor, and everything is doing, he's doing great. Everyone is doing well, and I'm super excited, of course, to be here. Um, as of right now, I have a master's degree in media design, and I'm super excited to now work for an organization here in Memphis called the Mid-South Transplant Foundation as the, as the digital communications coordinator, which I get to basically do stuff on social media, which I already love to do. So um, it's fun to be able to um, share stories and to not only tell my story, but help you know advocate for others and to help them share their stories so that's a little bit about me i'm sure as we talk more we will get into the depths of you know each other's story You're breaking up really bad. I can't understand nothing. So far, the work issue. Anthony, you're you're breaking up quite bad. We can't understand a word you're saying, buddy. So. <clears throat> Well, while he goes ahead and uh, and gets that together, we'll just keep going. Um, Bella Langston, Bella, uh, go ahead and tell us a little bit uh, about yourself. Sure. Hi, good evening, everybody. I am Audrey Bella Langston, but more so lovingly known as Bella. Uh, to most uh, of my friends and family. And uh, thank you so much for having me on this panel. Um, as far as my journey, <clears throat> excuse me, with transplantation, it's pretty in depth, but it's a really cool story. But as Tay said, uh, Artavius, Tay as I call him, I'm gonna cut through a lot of that. But basically, uh, currently I reside in Tampa, Florida. However, I am originally from Chicago, Illinois. I am the mother of two amazing adult children and grandmother of two. And I received my transplant May 4th, excuse me, March 4th of 2005. So I am coming upon my 17th year as well. And the really cool thing is that the day after that on the 6th, was my birth is my birthday and I will be celebrating my 60th birthday. And the irony in sharing that is that my journal my journey with kidney disease actually began on the weekend of my birthday. I am a retired Chicago police officer of 21 years. 
And I was out of town with friends when I suddenly became very, very ill. Now, my children were extremely young at that time. My uh, two kids are like uh, 10 years apart in age. And my daughter was uh, pretty much like six months old when I got on the police department. But um, I was thrusted into a terrible shift when I got on the job, which was midnights. And my body was so not accustomed to those hours. I worked, I was a nine to fiver girl all day long. And so that between the training that it takes to be an officer, the physical aspect, it was very, very challenging, especially after having just had a baby and uh, all the things that come along with motherhood but I did it. And, uh, but yeah, I was very um, busy. My life was very, very busy. And uh, this particular weekend was the weekend of my birthday, like I said, so I was celebrating it in Wisconsin Dells. In route, I was feeling very, very tired. Um, this is when I felt the brunt of it where I knew something, you know, I came to realize about 24 hours later that there was something wrong. I never got adjusted to working those hours. And I was uh, very athletic in great physical shape, uh, what I would consider the best shape of my life at that time after finishing six and a half months in the training academy. So I thought nothing that I would, that I may actually be sick. I just thought I was very tired because I would get off work and I would go right uh, to Bally's and work out and uh, go home and I wouldn't go directly to bed even then because now I'm wired. I would play with my daughter most of the day. So bottom line, I was going to bed like late about six or 6.30 in the evening and would have to be at work at 11 p.m. So obviously that's not enough rest, especially for that type of intense career, but this is what I did. And um, I was feeling lethargic. I was urinating quite frequently, which was very unusual for me, but with a very limited output of urine. I was a little nauseous, but not enough to have it, to complain about it. I just felt off. Something just didn't feel right about how, you know, I normally was uh, in my normal state of health. And so um, I was being encouraged to relax and, you know, eat a little something, you'll feel better, you're just tired. I took two bites of food, I couldn't eat anymore, I was so not hungry. And I just felt like I wanted to sleep, however, I wasn't comfortable at that particular time to go to sleep, I felt very restless. Um, I couldn't explain it at the time. I just knew that I had never felt like that before. So at some point I did doze off, but I remember vividly throughout the night, I was up and down going to the bathroom, same issue, slight urine, but not my normal type of urination. I was getting more nauseous at that point. So by the next morning, I, uh, you know, woke them up and said, hey, something's wrong with me. Uh, I'm going to have to go back home. I'm, I feel worse than yesterday. I'm sick. So of course, no problem. Uh, pack up everything, get in the car to head back to Chicago, which where uh, I was, was a, probably about a three hour, three and a half hour drive. And uh, I had to stop at the restroom. This was very consistent. And I say that for a reason, because this is generally uh, oftentimes signs of, of kidney problems. So I went in the bathroom, I went in with my purse um, and I, you know, tried to urinate again. It was more of a pressure. That's what it was, a pressure. But came back out to the car, um, we leave and about 10 minutes, um, someone said to me, where's your purse? And I go, what, where is your purse? You went in the bathroom with your purse and I go, I don't know and I don't care. I just want to be left alone. So that wasn't my normal character. That's agitation now starting to kick in. I had a headache that started to uh, kick in and intensify. So that was like a cue for that person to turn around and go back. And sure enough, there was my purse in the women's bathroom on the side 
of the uh, vanity with my weapon in it, my duty weapon, and probably about $200 in cash. That's how out of it I have be had become, which is so not my character. So uh, fast forward, we're about an hour outside of Chicago. I dozed off. I woke up probably about 30 minutes later and I opened my eyes only to realize that I could not see. I had gone completely blind during that time of that brief sleep. And I told the person driving and they were like, what? And, you know, I could feel the air. They were doing this thing. How many fingers am I holding up? And I was like, I don't know. I can't see them. And I just felt the gas gun and got to the hospital and I'm, I hear them talking. I can't see anybody and everybody's grabbing me and, you know, uh, asking me questions. And I was pretty much asked things like, you know, have you taken anything or no, no, no. And they were explaining to them, she's not like that. She's this is a cop and, you know, whatever. And so my head by that time was pounding. And I remember the nurse saying, lift out your tongue. I'm going to give you something that's going to take your, your blood pressure is currently like, it was like 180 over like about 130. That's why they said I lost my eyesight. My, it just totally took away my eyesight because the blood pressure was so out of control, which of course is what caused the severe headaches and things. So they started asking me questions about kid, if kid, kidney problems in my family, things like that. My grandmother actually died from kidney disease. I watched her through it. Um, I did share that. And so I was admitted. The next day I diagnosed with what's called focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Yes, 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 that is a very long name and I, it took me a while to pronounce it with total ease, but it's short term medically as FSGS. Um, so the all the tests, the biopsy, all these things were done. And the next morning a nephrologist came in and explained everything to me. Um, and basically just told me this is what you have. This is not going to get it. Uh, this is not going to get any better. And, you know, eventually you're going to be facing a transplant. And we want to put you on some medication right now to help slow the process down. And he started to explain that. And as he's explaining one of these meds, um, I said, is that, wait, is that that medication that blows people up? You know, it's prednisone. And he goes, well, yeah, but you, you know, it'll get tapered. I said, nope, I'm not taking that. I, I'm, I'm a cop. I cannot have, be like the uh, blimp. No, I'm not taking it. And so I refused. And I said, tell me what I can do. Everything that I should and should not do and I will do it. So I made a lot of dietary changes in my life. I wasn't a bad eater, but I cut out red meat, uh, beef, pork, never went back to it, salt, never went back to it. That was 19 years I probably haven't had beef and pork. So I did, with those changes, feel that I slowed down, thank God, with his grace and mercy, the progression of the disease because it did not start to get worse until about 2004 and it start everything started coming back and so at that point of course and i was put on the transplant list about a year prior to that the fortunate thing for me is i had at least four potential living donors at that time unfortunately of which all of them fell through for one reason or another and at that point, um, that was when my godson, Roger Reynolds, stepped up and offered to give me a kidney. And it went great. We went in the hospital again. Um, oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I did have to go on dialysis. It is important that I share that. I had to do prior to that six months while he went through his testing process. I chose peritoneal, which I believe we'll talk about some of those things later. And um, we had our transplant on a Friday, March 4th, 2005. And he went home the next day, that Saturday on the 5th. And I went home the next day on that Sunday, which happened to be my 43rd birthday at that time. Um, the only other thing I'll share is I hit the ground running. 
getting involved in organizations, educating myself is it, I urge everyone to do that. I have um, I host my own podcast <clears throat> for healing, um, and I'm with Tampa uh, General Hospital. Um, I guess I'll ask, could somebody mute themselves, please? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting double sound. I apologize. Thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I'm i uh, with Tampa General Hospital as one of their uh, transplant PFAC members and also with LifeLink of Florida. So I am very active and very passionate about getting the word out about transplantation, organ donation, and overall health. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you for that great story, and I'm back. Hopefully, my connection's a little bit better than what it was, because <laughs> I was having trouble. <laughs> I felt like I was on the Titanic, and I just hit the iceberg, and I was going down for the last count. <laughs> but we're back, yeah, and that's great. It's good to be now. here once again. <laughs> Loud, clear. Yeah. Uh, that's, I've got my mic. You know, I was trying to use my headphones, trying to use my phone. It was just, you know, this third strike. I'm, I'm not going to strike out. We're going to smash this thing up the park. But talking about, uh, let's bring on our next uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Fred Hill. Dialysis is not your life author and motivator. So, Fred, you want to give a little background about you? Yeah, I, I can. I can. Can everybody hear me? We'll make sure I'm good. Can y'all hear me? Um, I'm Fred Hill. I'm Fred Hill. Listen, um, again, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. A little about me. You know, I, um, I had polycystic kidney disease uh, for, for, for me. Um, um, from the background, uh, love God. I'm throwing it out there right now. I absolutely love God. Um, and from for me, everything for me, sports. Um, I was a supervisor uh, at the BMW plant here. Uh, it's what I all this right here was basically my background. Um, but the thing about for for us, I remember my sister. Uh, she she um, brought all of us together, brothers and sisters. And this was um, in the early 2000s. And she said, listen, I need all of y'all to get checked. She said, because, listen, I went to the doctor. She had some issues going on. Um, and they found out she had polycystic kidney disease and said, the only way you can find this out is through ultrasound. So she said, all of you need to go because it's uh, hereditary. And um, my grandmother had already died from it. And so when I went, I had it. I had polycystic kidney disease, just like my sister. Speeded up a little bit. My sister ended up passing away. Had another cousin um, uh, pass away as 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 well. Um, and so when it became my time uh, with dialysis uh, in 2012, my whole mindset was okay. My grandmother died, my sister died, uh, my aunt died, my cousin died. So what's going to happen to Fred Hill? And the mind, my mind says, listen, you're going to die. You're going to die. So I was full of fear the whole time. And so once I actually, uh, and the crazy thing about this was for me, I didn't have any, any symptoms. I mean, I, I stayed in the gym, exercised all the different things. Now, all of my numbers had. But I did not have any and have no swelling. I was still urinating, uh, feeling good at the time. I wasn't tired, all of these things. And so um, my doctor was telling me that I was at a place where I should, uh, brain should have been shutting down in a place to where uh, body should have been septic and all of this, but I wasn't feeling anything going on. So when I went and I had a second opinion and my uh, the other doctor told me, said, you should have been on dialysis. And so I still didn't feel anything. So one day at work, I got dizzy and it wouldn't shake. I stayed, they stayed dizzy to, uh, it was about maybe 10 minutes uh, and I couldn't shake it. I couldn't shake it. Couldn't shake it. So dizzy. And so from that point, like once I came to myself, I said, listen. So um, from that, I ended up going on dialysis. And from that point, then I started getting tired. Um, so I started dialysis and listen, full of fear. Um, and the thing that really changed my life was telling my son, uh, he was 10 at the time, listen, uh, uh, went through the can't do list. Uh, you can't do this, can't do this. We can't because me and my son, we're, we're still crazy close right now. Um, he's doing football. I'm doing the daddy thing and all this. And so uh, when they told me the things that I couldn't do, I went into a bad depression. I was in a bad place. But something hit me. Something hit me to to realize that, listen, uh, although the people who are around you, I mean, in this, I mean, I, I can't speak this for everyone else's center, but the center where I was, I mean, I just didn't like how um, 
everyone, no one was living their life. No one was living their life. And I'm like, and I'm falling to the same rut of, of being on dialysis and being tired and you go home, go to sleep, dialysis. I'm, I'm on peritoneal now and all this right here. And I said, listen, dialysis is the second chance at life and you blowing it, man. Dialysis is another chance for you to live out loud, live your life, but you blowing it. You sitting here, look at your wife, look at your children, look at not going on vacation. Look at you, man, get it together. So it came to a place. I said, the only thing that I really knew was exercise. So I started exercising. I uh, ended up having a hernia. I think, uh, um, uh, um, what's, I'm sorry, uh, Tafaro talked about that. And so um, for me, I had to learn how to exercise on my own because nothing was going on in Spartanburg, South Carolina uh, for me. And so uh, I learned how to exercise by learning what not to do. And so I began to change my life and begin to, to, to modify my life. And I said, I got to get my life back. And so I started to learn how to live my life while I was on dialysis. And so I thank God that he turned my tragedy into triumph. He turned my test into a, a testimony. And from that point, I started writing. And um, got my got a 15. And, and, and so I, I and I got my personal trainer uh, uh, certification. I began training people on dialysis, just like uh, 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 Tafaro, man. I'm telling you, that, and, and from that point, I went back and I got my certification as a dialysis technician to find out what is it on the other side so I can train back, but train better. I wanted to know uh, what is it, what is it on the other side of the chair and so from that point to kind of that point uh, uh listen i come back, back again i'm now certified dialysis life counselor and so it comes to a point from writing the book god has blessed this book to 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 be uh used as a tool in the uk uh throughout america uh switzerland new zealand australia austria and uh it's being used in the uh, medical educational institute the kidney academy i mean God is able to turn things around. I'm an advocate. I'm a motivational speaker to let you know all because you are on dialysis does not mean that your life is over. You can still live, go on vacation. I mean, the sex life back. You can get it. You can you can get in the gym. I mean, you can live your life. I mean, you really can. I'm a witness. I'm a witness. And so that's why I'm here today. I'm excited about life. That's the whole thing there is to understand that Alice's is a second chance at life when you can grasp this thing and understand that it's not a time for us to feel like life is over because without the Alice's man, we'd be dead. We all would be dead. So looking at i don't know who's watching this but i'm telling you so if you're on dialysis listen don't allow that to damper your spirit to feel that your life is over man i'm so full right now because i want you to understand you can live your life go get it get up from it's hard work i'm gonna still throw it's hard work but you can you can because i mean dialysis affects your heart listen when you're on, on hemo i mean it causes your heart to swell and, and, and that is painful. So let me ask you a question. What are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do with your life? Live it. Get your life back. Know that dialysis is not your life. I knew I went over my time, y'all. I'm sorry. But I'm, hey, I'm excited. I, hey, we can live. Man, preach it, brother. Preach yeah, it, man. Bro. We, we yeah, you, you have all that energy. Keep it at this time of night. I don't know. You know, it's, it's what, almost 9 o'clock where I am. And like, and yeah, it's, you know, preach it, brother. Preach it. Say what you got to say. And you got it. You got it right. Yes. You got it right. Keep it going. Awesome story, Fred. Awesome story, Fred. Hey, you, you, you got me excited, bro. I'm gonna keep you know, it going. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I love it. Hey, I'm telling you. I, I feel like going to work out right now. Like I need to get back in my gym right now. Right, right. Let's get it, man. Get life, man. Enjoy life. Every moment I look at it, man. You maximize every moment of your life because we had this chance. We got kidneys, guys. Those of us on kidneys, we got kidneys, man. Maximize that time. Don't allow anything, even in the bag. 
there's something good that you can find out of that to turn everything around. I'm telling you, I'm excited that I'm still alive. I'm excited that, I mean, hey, I didn't allow dialysis to take me under, but I use it as a stepping stone to get my life back. I mean, hey, you I mean, I said, I said like this when I'm training, try and then modify. If you can't, if you try, it ain't working, modify. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. That's right. Don't That's give right. up. All right. I'm sorry, man. Y'all got it. I'm sorry. I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's all right, man. apologize, brother. <laughs> you ain't got to eat. We needed that. Don't apologize. That was awesome, man. That, that, that was beautiful. Thank you. We, we we all needed that, right? We all needed that. It was great. Yes. I, I received it. I received it. All, but I, I'm pretty sure me and Alex probably need to hear. But, uh, you know, I you definitely don't have to apologize when you're in this space, brother. We all, you know, been through it or going through it. So definitely don't need to apologize. Man. We understand where your passion is coming from 100%. We appreciate it for sure. Uh, Anthony, go ahead and take it away, sir. Oh, man. And I'm supposed to follow that, but that's okay. We got great questions because I want to follow up with what Fred was talking about and want to ask each and every can one everybody of everybody mute? What? Can everybody mute Step Anthony? Yeah, I want yeah everybody please mute, mute yourself if you're not talking to yourself. Hey, that's better. <laughs> that's good. Uh, us three as well. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's good. That's 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 good. So to follow up on Fred, what Fred was talking about, one of the things that all of us that have been on dialysis or on, are on dialysis, all face certain challenges. So my question to each one of y'all, and you can go around the room, we can start with Alex and just go around like we were going. So what was the greatest challenge that you, and what has been the greatest lesson that you've learned? Okay. Um, I think the greatest challenge of dialysis is for me, uh, was learning to accept that this wasn't, it's something Fred mentioned. And I think we all have mentioned at one point, like the fear factor, you know, I was the youngest person in my, uh, my unit by like 30 years, you know, back when I first did hemo to instant hemo. And so, you know, I think the lesson I learned was to realize that like, just because I'm around people who are older than me and may have passed away next to me or may have been sickly next to me, you know, um, I've learned that, you know, this is just a blip on my life and that it's not that the kidney disease isn't necessarily to define me as a whole person. Uh, but that really like I'm Alex who has a family. I'm Alex who, who, you know, loves baseball and, and things of that nature, but I, I happen to have kidney disease. And so, I've learned over the years to not let it like kind of define me. Uh, that's been hard because it's for a long time. I feel like, you know, I've had to deal with um, feeling like that. It was a def def defining um, like piece of me, like my kidney disease was just part of me. And like, I was a burden to my family and all the, and the depression and all the anxiety that came, that came with that. Um, but what's the second part of the question, Anthony? Uh, what is the greatest lesson that you've learned from that challenge? So the, oh, thank you. So, I mean, yeah, like I said, I think the lesson is to know that in, this is, disease is just, again, like I kind of said, like, I think for me, it's just, it's just part of me. Um, it's not something that it's defining me completely and that it's, it's a blip and that I know that I can get up and kind of move forward and kind of continue to be the light in the in this in this world of kidney disease and and know that like and stay positive you know i don't know if most of you guys here some of you folks on here know me and my social media presence um and i'm generally a very positive person i try to kind of be upbeat and try not to think about the negativity things that are going on in the world and try to kind of be positive so same with the dialysis when i was on dialysis i try to be as positive as i can um and, and but not like fake positive you know like I'm genuinely just a positive person who like who looks at life as in a good place, and I know that there are some folks who are like, "Man, the reality is life sucks." I'm like, "Well, I mean, you can look at it that way, and I respect that, and that's what you feel." But this is how I feel, and we can both dis agree to disagree. 
but I'm going to still stay positive because it's better than being negative. I'd rather put out the positive energy vibes than negative energy vibes to people. So I guess I hope I answered your question. <laughs> you did. You did. Definitely. Thanks. And that's a great answer. Great answer. Great lessons that you learned from that. So let's keep going around the room. What about um, you, Artemis? What is the greatest challenge and then the greatest lesson that you've learned? So, first off, shout out to Fred. Man, look, I was trying to keep it together in the beginning. I'm like, okay, we just going to ease into that thing. But you came out like, I'm like, okay, I guess we ready for that. Okay. So, um, for me, the biggest, and it's kind of like both of them together, the biggest challenge I faced was fitting in. And the biggest lesson I learned was you weren't meant to fit in. So the thing when it comes for me, um, when I was on dialysis, again, I was I was diagnosed at three and I went on dialysis at 13. So, of course, during that time, you can think back during teenage years, I was just getting ready to go into high school. So my thing was, I'm, I've am i never been that type of kid that was like the cool kid. Or not. I, just, I could make people laugh and we could do all that, but I always wanted to fit in. And when it came to dialysis, I didn't want to share that with my friends because as a teenager, trying to trying to explain kidney disease to a teenager, the only thing they will hear is the disease part and think that it's contagious and they would want to mess with me no more. So I didn't want to tell them that. So I was trying to, you know, work through that. But learning the thing was trying to fit in. And once I realized that, okay, look, you weren't meant to fit in and that's okay. It takes it's. Going on dialysis takes a whole different mindset. And like what Fred was saying, it's like you have to, it's a certain mindset you have to have because it it life sucks. It, it gets like that. But the thing is, it's it's your perspective. How are you going to look at it? And for me, I had to learn that, okay, look, this is what it is. We either we either gonna fight with it or we're gonna let it fight us. So for me, my mother, she she's also a kidney transplant recipient as well. I think for her, it's been 22 years post um dial post transplant. And for her, she always she gave me the opportunity to, you know, be vulnerable. And she was like my coach. She was like, okay, look, I'm gonna tell you what it is. It's gonna hurt. You're gonna be scared. You ain't gonna like it. You're gonna wanna cry. You wanna talk about it. You're gonna wanna you wanna do nothing. But look. If you need to go cry, go on over there and cry. Do what you got to do. And then when you finish, you come on back. And we're going to keep going. And having that type of, having my mother instilling that in my head, produce the person I am today when it comes to me motivating people or inspiring people or empowering people to go for the things that you want to go for, no matter what adversity you may be faced with. And again, trying to fit in. You weren't meant to fit in. Find your lane. And you do what you need to do. And as time go on, you will get more in tune with who you are and what you want to do. And the other people will come that support you. So I think for me, like I said, the hardest, the biggest challenge was to fit in. And the, the biggest reward that I learned that I wasn't meant to fit in. And that's okay. Awesome. We appreciate that. I think it's always interesting to learn different perspectives. And I think it helps each and every one of us to have a, a different perspective on life each and every time. And just wonderful. All right, Bella, what about you? What's the greatest challenges that you faced or the greatest challenge, one of the greatest challenges, and one of the greatest lessons that you've learned? So I would say for me, um, the greatest challenge that I faced <clears throat> with regard to dialysis was initially just the acceptance of it when the day came to have that experience for the first time hit me like a ton of bricks to sit down in that chair and know that that 15 gauge was about to go in my arm and uh unfortunately got infiltrated by my nurse and you know she went in for those who aren't familiar with that it's when you go in with the cannulator um and it goes which is the needle but goes straight through at my vein and it caused a bleed in my arm which was excruciatingly painful 
And that was when another nurse asked her, had she introduced to me the possibility of uh, PD because she felt that it would be much better for me from my lifestyle. And I was like, what is that? Tell me about it. And I could not have agreed more at that time. That was the greatest thing for me. I watched my grandmother sit through dialysis centers doing hemo and I would visit her often even when I was on duty and you know and and all of them in there just looking very sick very tired um I do so much agree with what Fred said and the energy that he has brought you know to his life during that time and the energy that that will bring to most of us but I will say I think what has to come first is working on a person's mindset. You have to get yourself in that mindset to have that type of optimism. It does not come naturally, unfortunately, for everybody, especially our senior citizens. And oftentimes we can kind of tend to not necessarily forget about them, but they kind of get put on the back burner. And I know because I watched it take it steal the life out of my grandmother's spirit as well as others. And watching her take a hit every time she would come back to dialysis the day after or whatever, and one of her 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 buddies uh, who was in the chair next to her, and she didn't see him and asked where they were, and they would have to tell my grandmother that that person transitioned. And so though, though that's a great strategy, but I think that we kind of have to have a little different strategy to keep our seniors uh, motivated. Um, unfortunately, you know, when you they are, their ways, our traditions are involved in them. They're not going to view that. And they really do need that love, too. So th I think that is one thing that I have been saying I'm going to work on trying to devise to, to be able to get through to seniors who are on dialysis more. But the greatest thing about it is that for me, I have always been, a, you know, an uplifting person. I, I have a lot of energy. I consider myself to be a leader by nature. Um, and so I knew that I would get through it, so to speak, as far as the lesson involved. You know, it was like God put on my heart right away. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This too shall pass. You're going to be fine. And because of my research and learning about it more, I think that is the absolute best thing that anybody can do for themselves is to educate themselves on it. Now, little did I know at that time that everything that I had gone through would eventually culminate into all the you know plethora, plethora of things that I'm doing in the industry now, which I absolutely love. And that's how God uses us. It's not just about us and our healing. And once we're okay, we continue to go forth with our life. It's about helping other people. And that's where the power resides. That's where even possible longevity of these organs reside because many of, I mean, I interviewed the uh, longest African-American who had a kidney, George Hamilton. I interviewed him on my show, 45 years. He's had the same kidney. Now that man is an athlete, just like um, some of the guys who are athletic have shared, you know, getting our body and mind in sync with each other is straight power. It really is. And that is true. That is what I hope to see more in our people, especially because we do dominate in kidney disease. And also we need to educate better on organ donation. That is a very sad thing. And this is the arena that I'm in with regard to LifeLink of Florida. And so to in that close this out, the greatest lessons have been me walking the walk so that today, now I can talk the talk and I'm not just, you know, chirping from textbook. I've actually lived it and I can save other people prayerfully through prevention. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> It was a great, great answer. Great answer. 
All right, Fred, what about you? The greatest challenges that you greatest challenge that you face and the greatest lesson that you took took from that challenge. All right, for 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 me, I think you know the the, the greatest challenge for me, because when I went on dialysis, I was 40 years old. So I'm saying you're still feeling young. And um, when you walk in, I was slipping away. I think that was, uh, um, I love to laugh. I mean, one thing, I mean, I thought, you know, it, when I was young, a kid or whatever, I thought I was going to be a comedian. I mean, I really, really love laughter. I love life. And so when you, I walk in and it seems like life is slipping away. Um, and it, I, I think for me, that was, that was, that was, um, that was real hard that was real hard for someone who loves to laugh and someone who um, loved playing love. I mean, it, it was, um, what are you going to do Fred Hill? What are you going to do? And it felt like I was, um, felt like I was trapped. Um, because you feel like, you, you know, there's no, no, there's no, no, put it for no one in my family who had the polystic disease made it out nobody made it out and so um that's all i saw was death um so it was that was really hard um even here doing doing the dialysis on the um the peritoneal um nighttime hurting and i mean it just felt like you couldn't escape there was no um there was nothing else um just being lost i think that's for me um and I remember saying, uh, going to the clinic and you sitting in there and um, I'm not saying this judgmental. I hope there's no one takes this as saying judgmental because uh, I don't think I'm better to anyone. Uh, but I remember telling myself, I don't want to look like that. I don't want to like this person. I don't want to because um, they look, everybody looked like life was over. And for me, I'm sitting in here, and I remember when I had to do the, um, the hemo, and I'm looking at the people beside me, and I'm like, I don't want to look like this. I don't want to. I don't want to be that person. And I think that that was the, the hardest challenge because no one, um, y'all, excuse me. I'm sorry. Wow. I'm sorry. No one, no one seemed like they wanted anything out of life. And, and so the people who were around me, they didn't have no answers for me. And my doctors, um, this was in 2012, and my doctors, I mean, no one um, had been on dialysis, and so they could only give you the medical um, view and so i didn't have no help i didn't have nowhere to go um so for me is when you feel like your life is slipping how do you grab hold of life um wow i'm sorry i'm sorry y'all i'm trying to get this thing together <sighs> thing like um bella was saying it's all right man it's all right thing like bella was saying it's it's, a, it's the mindset and if you don't see nobody living if you don't see nobody living and you don't see nobody they don't look like they're winning and i'm a winner i'm a winner but i don't see nobody winning and at the time i don't know how to win because i don't have a coach i don't have nobody saying fred get in there stay in there fred do this get these drills so, um when you have the athletic you don't have that so i'm at home and my wife and my son is here but the reality is they love me, but how do you grasp on to life when life is slipping? Oh, man. Oh, man. And so it took a while. Like I said, you know, I was depressed for a while. I was depressed for a while. It was over a year until I know in prayer time and God was showing me, you, you feel like life is slipping away. But if you really look at it, you, you're attached to life. Every time you hook up to the the catheter to the PD, you're actually hooking up to life. And I, and so to, for, for me, um, the greatest lesson is, is learning how to be grateful, learning how to be grateful. And when I learned that, you know, in the midst of my exchange, exchanging, I was saying, thank you. Cause I'm, I'm alive. Thank you. 
And so um, learning that in the midst of however, even in the pain, and now I have a kidney and it, it, listen, I've learned how to be grateful in the good and the bad. Why? Because I'm alive to be able to, to deal with the bad. Um, because if I'm, in, if I'm in the grave, you know, hey, how are you going to, it mean, it, it mean, the challenges of life, um, it still excites me because, hey, man, you are alive to do it. So bills do. Um, life happens. Uh, whatever, man. But it, it took a place for me to say, hey, listen, Lord, I thank you. I'm alive. I'm in my right mind. Yep. You know, um, Lord, I yep. thank you. I, I got health and strength. Lord, I thank you. You know, hey, right. um, I don't look like what I've been through. And so for for that, life is a place to where I don't take this moment here for granted. I mean, I guess I get that a, a lot. Like, where do you get this energy from? Man, I'm excited about life. And so when it comes to a place where the whomever I'm talking to, whoever I see, I don't take you guys, I don't take no one on this panel for granted. I don't take, I don't care if I'm pumping gas, the person beside me, I don't take them for granted because I'm alive to see them. And so when circumstances and those different things come, I think for me, the greatest lesson is to learn to say great, be, to be grateful. I mean, I know this is not church, but one of my favorite scriptures is, and we know all things work together to its purpose. So that tells me in every situation, God is able to turn it around for my good. So therefore be grateful in the good That's right. and in the bad. All right, that's for the best. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Wonderful, wonderful answer, Fred. Wonderful. And it's okay. Emotions are the window to the soul. And you can see what people are, the passion and the purpose that there is. It's because those of us on this panel are answering our purpose and our calling in life. And yeah. it's really shining through through each and every one of y'all's answers. So I got a few more questions, and we're just going to make it. Uh, kind of just kind of go through kind of rapid fire questions. So uh, with all the information that you have now, each and every one of y'all, uh, knowing back, if you were back at that start, you know, would you choose the same modality or would you choose a different one? So I'll go for it next. Fred, since um, you're on the screen, oh, uh, you're good. Ready Go for it. Want to see you. you sure? Okay. So my uh, interaction, my first time with he in Center Hemo, nobody told me about any modalities. This was now 2006. I was like, like I said, I crashed into dialysis. I did hemodialysis for the 18 months. But while I was on that dialysis, there was no mention from my nephrologist about PD, home hemo, nocturnal, nothing. Fast forward 13 years later or whatever when my kidney failed again, now my nephrologist all of a sudden talks to me about all these modalities, all these choices. So it's interesting just what what time will do, right? And how much the changes will, how much there there's change in just the dialogue and what the the message is. Because the message when I was first doing it was in center hemo, that's all you got. Boom, you should be doing this until you get a kidney. And then you know, again, fast forward later, here I am, and now I'm doing PD because one. He told me about it, and I was also I had you know at this point I had even as a transplant recipient I had knew all my modalities in front of me. I mean I'm a pretty you know I think all of us on this on this on this panel are pretty savvy to know all the modalities ahead of us. So um, I knew kind of what was in front of me if I was ever to go back on dialysis, and I knew I wanted to do PD. So I was a proper a big proponent of wanting to do PD. So to answer your question, Anthony. Um, yeah, like I would have, you know, changed my, I mean, in the first time around, I would have changed it to PD in the first, from the get-go, if I had that opportunity. Um, and now with, you know, obviously I would have loved to do, you know, um, preemptive transplant if I could have, but that just didn't work. So here I am doing uh, PD and hopefully I'll get a kidney here this year. God willing. Okay, I guess I'll go next. 
I don't know what he yeah. would, but I guess I'll go next. Right. I guess I'll go next. Um, for me, I believe I will stick with the same one I had. I was on hemodialysis. Um, and the reason I think I believe I will stay on hemo is because from my first time, like I said, then I was a teenager versus now at 32. Um, what I what I took for granted on dialysis while I was in center was um, in the beginning of it was being able to talk with the other patients because I think I'm a big believer in representation and a big believer in leading by example and um, showing people that no matter what adversity you may face in life, you can still, you know, be successful in whatever you do. So if that time comes where I had to go back, I will go back on hemo to be able to once show people that I'm still the same person and to be able to encourage and empower others along their journeys to believe more in themselves and to, um, you know, just give, give people grace and show them the different perspective that you can make it through this. And it just takes, for me, I believe it just takes one person to be the example and to, to show people that no matter what you go through, you can do it. And I would definitely go back that route to um, be that blessing and to show people that it's all right. We can get through this together. So that's a quick answer of what I would do. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, Great. go for it. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so um, it's been a long time for me with that. I just like Tay as well. But um, I am a person who, again, I'm going to weigh all my options. Um, the great thing about medicine now is that it is evolving so quickly that the innovation is just off the chain. And so they're always coming out with newer and better ways to do things. Um, and again, back then, chemo, I can't even realize wasn't for me. I think it was more so because I was traumatized by that infiltration. However, it was more than that. It was more so about, you know, God leading me to PD. Peritoneal was so much better. I came to realize from my lifestyle, it gave me more flexibility. Um, I did the night, the night cycler. So I was doing probably about the, if I remember correctly, it was the five liter bags and it was about three bags of that, three bags of, of those five liter bags. So it was actually filtering through my system roughly probably about at least four times a night. I remember that very distinctly. distinctly. Now, I, I will say that PD is definitely not for everybody. It's not. It's, it's a lot, it, it involves a lot more strategic discipline um, with that. And also there's always the risk of, of acquiring peritonitis, which you definitely don't wanna get that. I believe one of the brothers actually shared that he had had that. Um, fortunately, I never got it, but I was very strict on, you know, mask wearing, you know, like if my daughter again, you know, my, my son was in, 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 in uh, college by then, but my daughter was still home with friends coming by. So you could not come in my room. I never stopped working. Let me say when I got diagnosed, I continued to be a police officer. The only time I went into a different status was when it got to be more aggressive as I got closer to the time of needing dialysis. And then they allowed, they put me in administration, which was great uh, for me and a blessing. It was a blessing to have such a uh, understanding uh, career where they facilitated my need when I needed it. And um, I was always, you know, grateful for that aspect of the job. Um, and so I would have to be, I worked days, I got to pick my own shift, 
I'm a morning girl. I used to go work out early in the morning. So I was, I wanted to be there by 6 a.m. and out by two. But my lieutenant was so awesome. He knew I was on dialysis at night. He said, I don't want to see you here past 1130, 11 o'clock, because I know you got a family. And so I was, that was such a blessing for my life because I was able to get home and facilitate my daughter uh, and her activities and her sports and things in school. But I had and fix dinner and I had to be on that machine faithfully every night by um, 8 p.m. Okay, and once you're on it, you're on it unless you they don't like you to disconnect unless it's for an emergency. So fortunately, I had a master bathroom in my bedroom and fridge. I just everything was set up for me to be convenient. And I would have to be on that machine um, for nine hours a night. And it was while I slept and it would disconnect faithfully every morning about 5 a.m and I would have to clean the tube. That was the unsexy part, <laughs> having the, the tube protruding from your abdomen all the time, because you have to be really careful with that tube. And, and so, um, but I did it. I made it work and I jump in the shower and put on my uniform and went to work every single day of that entire six and a half months. And that was a learning experience that showed as well for me that I could persevere through that, that I could get through it. If I could do all of that, I wasn't one to share my story with a lot of people. In fact, most officers didn't know it until I was being discovered by the, uh, I was being followed by the Discovery Health Channel, um, but it didn't unfortunately manifest because the person that was gonna donate at that time backed out, unfortunately. However, uh, I was in one of our largest papers, the Chicago Sun-Times, and that's when most officers found out I was sick. Most of them didn't know because people tend to want to put a face on sickness. And that is really ridiculous to me, but it's true. So many actually, I heard, felt I was faking, if you can believe that. Like, who's going to fake a life threatening illness? But anyway, that was because I kept myself up physically as I had always done. I kept my spirit up. I never wavered or changed in who I was. Uh, again, because I didn't want the sympathy, I didn't want all the questions. I was totally focused on survival. I was in surviving mode and doing the absolute very best thing that I thought for to, to get me, um, you know, through uh, the situation. And prayer, thank God, got me through it. So, um, just to, to answer that, I would have to say, yeah, I probably would do PD again, just because of, of of how convenient it was for my life at that time. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Fred, what about you? Well, um, for me, I guess it's 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 simple for me because number one. Um, I don't like the sight of blood. I can't. Oh, I don't like blood. Um, it is, I'm going to say this. As someone who loves scary movies, uh, I just don't like seeing my own. Uh, and then again, I cannot stand needles. And that big needle that I seen, oh my gosh. I don't know if I could mentally, That I think that was my talent. And so I'm like, um, like Bella. I'm grateful that I was led to, for, well, I'm going to put it that way, because my doctor said it's either or, and you need to make a decision. And so um, uh, we didn't have this the sessions right now to kind of talk about the plus, the minuses, the ins, out, goods, and bads, uh, which one. Um, so I did choose because of blood and needles to go to peritoneal. Um, and I'm grateful because it turned out great for my life. Um, uh, for, for me, um, for me, it's, it, it, it was I was able to balance my life, you know, and I was at also on the night um, What you call it the big night thing or whatever and I did nine hours as well And so for me that was that was good for me. That was really good for me um, And again, my son was young and so uh, Taking him to school and doing all those different things being a part of life in school and football basketball baseball all this stuff to track um, and uh, it was that was that was good for me and I, for me i did i didn't have to have needles i guess that's for me and so for those who are doing the hemo uh god bless you 
um, I just I'm grateful. I think you know for me the peritoneal I would I would stay there. I would stay there. Okay. All right. Awesome. All right. I've got a question. Uh, just uh, two, one one question for each and every one of y'all. Um, if it, what was one what 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 quote helped you through your through through um, what quote has helped you the most, or what book has helped you the most throughout this whole challenge that you faced? Um, Alex, are you still on? I am. Yeah, I'm still here. I'm just trying to think about it. I mean, that might be my last question before I got to disconnect uh, to connect to my recycler. Actually, that's fine. Um, I don't know if I have a book or a quote, but I do have some. Uh, there's definitely music that really um, makes me um, kind of keeps me positive, keeps me going. And it's the band Switchfoot. Um, they have a song called meant to live that's uh really kind of is like my anthem as i kind of went through dialysis the first time around and as i continue to go through dialysis now that i play uh throughout the course of my treatment sometimes with my headset as if, if i can't sleep um which is another thing you know it's with pd sometimes there's insomnia that comes with it um but anyway yeah i would say for me it's music and it's, it's definitely um switch foot and a meant a song meant to live um or meant to breathe i think is what it's called but it's anyway it's a great song it's been my anthem ever since i started dialysis uh i'm, I'm gonna hop off here and say thank you guys very much for this opportunity hope to look forward to speaking with you guys at any other future in venues um feel free to kind of reach out to me if you'd like do social media on facebook uh and twitter um at just alex barrios look me up uh and we can go from there but thank you so much for the time uh and you all have a good night Thanks, Alex. Thanks for you. coming on. All right. Good night. All right. So I guess I'm next, right? <clears throat> yes. Yes, you are. <laughs> Someone, I don't know. If, I'm sure y'all hear someone's breathing like in the mic. Um, for me, it's <laughs> that one, that question is a lot for me because um as i said before my my thing was being able to fit in and i struggled a lot with self-esteem and a lot of different mental things that i went through um as a child and as a teenager and i would say the thing that that helped me was a dream and it was a dream where you know how you have a dream when you're talking with god and for me in this dream it was like just imagine like you in the airplane and you know i can see over the clouds so the dream was just like that and i couldn't see a physical figure but i can hear his voice and during that time in my life i was um very suicidal and depressed i went to suicide twice and at this point i just i didn't believe in myself and i just didn't it was a lot for a lot of people who don't understand dialysis is a lot and it's definitely it does a lot to the mental if you're not if like we was like we've been saying the whole time you're not into the right head space or have the right mindset about it it's man get you a coach get you somebody you can talk to but in the dream um god told me <clears throat> always believe in yourself because i know i believe in you and for me that was very powerful because i felt like i didn't believe in myself and even though people were around i had a great support system it was different for just me because if you don't believe in yourself how do you expect you know others to believe in you and when i woke up from a dream i wrote it down and everywhere I go, I tell my supporters, everybody, always believe in yourself because I know I believe in you. And I'm I'm at a very, very great spot in my life now where I get to mentor um, teenagers and I get to talk with people. And I even wrote, wrote a book just like Fred. I got my book too, Becoming a Living Testimony. And to be able to share my personal journey and my story of 
me becoming a living testimony because I didn't feel like I was one. But through the journey and through through the the storms of going through life and going through dialysis and going through the different phases of becoming a teenager and experiencing puberty, as we know how that is with all these emotions and everything, um, that quote really, you know, grounded me and to really shift my perspective into doing things. And I had a one of the things when I was on dialysis, I my my doctor came and told me that my um, my line had blew out. And basically what that means is stop working. So they had to change it to the other side. And during that time I had to I had to had to do a little praying. And when I tell people, when I talk to God, I talk to him just like one of my homeboys at that time. I was like, okay, look, play a look. <laughs> we gotta talk. So I I made a I made a promise to God. I made a, a bet with God. And I was like, if you can get me if you can get me off of here i promise i would do everything in my power to help somebody else because my thing was i always saw us as far as like african americans in the in the units where we're getting dollars but i never saw us on tv or in those boardrooms or presenting speaking on our behalf it was always somebody that was a lot older and who was white and i was like i can't relate to that so i told myself when i get to that point i would be that person i wish i had growing up for somebody else and this became my motto in my life was to be the person you wish you had growing up for somebody else. So every chance I get to share my story to empower people to always believe in yourself, no matter the opinions of others, whether it's about your lifestyle, your sexuality, your class, whatever it is, no matter what nobody say about you, as long as you know who you are and you believe in what you want, that's all that matters as you go through this life and as you become more of who you are and accept who you are and figure out what your purpose is in life everything would then become full circle and it would your support system or your team will come around and i try every chance i get to empower others because again we don't know when our last time is we don't know but every time i get a chance to talk with somebody is to always be true and honest with yourself transparency is your power and never shy away from your journey because your journey is your truth even though all of us witness dialysis every last one of our stories are different so own your story figure out the best way to tell it that has the most impact and always believe in yourself because i know i believe in you and I hope that empowers you. Awesome. Awesome. Awesome answer. All right, Bella, what about you? You one of the a quote or a book that helped you? Um, yeah, I mean, I I read I, I love first of all, I love to read. Again, uh, you know, I'm I'm that believer, knowledge is power. Um I love to journal and um, so I've read, I have so many favorites. I love poetry um, because I I used to actually write a little poetry when I was, when I was younger, I actually said I wanted to kind of get back into that. But um, I have to always first give the glory to God for who I am and who I've become even since being a Christian, which has been now about eight years. And it's never to say that we don't still have our faults and shortcomings and sin. Um, We're told that in Romans 3.23, we've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But just how he orchestrated my life from the time of my illness when I was not a Christian, I loved God. However, I wasn't embracing him as Lord and Savior. I hadn't repented and and changed my ways so I could see the world through that new set of eyes, unlike I have done now. And from that has come so much more wisdom 
and and grace and and just gratitude for not just life but just being able to know that the greatest thing that i can do to glorify in him is to love his people because he loves the downtrodden he loves those that are in need and one thing i learned going through my illness is not everyone has a support base not everyone is a good is good at really honing in on surviving i think i said that earlier and and you know as we were talking about that when when fred was speaking so this is where i feel i come in that's why i'm a part of tampa general uh hospitals patient family advisory counter pfac that is what we do i am that voice for the people who don't have that voice and so once one um poem that uh, I'm a lover of Maya Angelou. And one poem that stuck with me during the time that I was going through my illness um, uh, says, my mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive and to do so with passion, with some compassion, some humor and some style. And if you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. It's one of the greatest gifts that you can ever give to yourself. And that is to forgive. I love that because a little bit of my life and what I was going through and even what I'm doing now has all transpired from, from that poem. Awesome. I love it. Love it. All right, Fred, what about you? Um, for me, um, I, 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 I couldn't, for me, I, I didn't, there were no books for me. Um, all the books that, 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 that I was reading was actually the medical side of saying, uh, what's going on with your body? What's going on with dialysis? This is how dialysis works. And, um, that's that's all I had, but there was nothing to teach you how to live uh, your life out loud uh, and enjoy your life while you were on dialysis. That's what I was looking for. Um, but what I turned to this, that, I mean, I, I um, the Bible was was my that was that was my 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 core, which again Romans eight and twenty eight, and and we know all things. So, so for me. Um, I knew that it wasn't good. It didn't feel good, didn't look good, but somehow, some way it was going to work out for my good. But I couldn't sit and twiddle my thumbs to say here, because I believe that God gives you, uh, uh, as Bella was saying, knowledge. God gives you the insight, and uh, but you got to do the work. And so with that, now for me as well, uh, cartoons. Now, I absolutely, I'm 50 years old, but I absolutely still love cartoons i'm saying the bugs bunny the uh the tom and jerry of the popeyes i'm talking about the old school uh to kind of keep me smiling and keep me going uh and then as uh bella was saying as well i journal and so for me that was the thing that you have to do because i said where do you find life when you know ain't nothing around for you to grab onto so for me journaling and so for me that was um i hope it's okay but that's the reason why i had to write i thank god i had to write dialysis is not your life redefining your life while on dialysis it is available on amazon.com go look for it please um is it okay if I do this so y'all can see this? Dialysis is not your life .com. Um, and create the dialysis is not your life program at dialysis is not your life uh, .com as well. But the book is available on Amazon um, to be able to see. So it's not a medical book. Those of you have already read it. It's not a medical book. It kind of talks a little bit, but it's talking about how to live your life while you're on dialysis. Goes through different steps and shows you um, how to live and knowing in, in a place of understanding that life is uh, life is still here uh, and it's what you make it. And so it's about you putting in the work. It's not going to be easy, but you can live your life. And so for me, um, that's the reason to, to be able. And that's why I'm an advocate. That's why I'm a motivational speaker. Um, that's why I'm, 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 I'm training. That's why I'm, I mean, my whole thing is I, I, I want to help somebody to understand that your life is not over. 
And so for me, that's the excitement. I mean, I'm I'm full of life. And I, I believe when you when you grasp that to understand and and uh, um you still have something to offer. And I think that as Bella was saying earlier, um uh, uh there's no reason for you to I mean I think you know the 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 low self-esteem because again the tube coming out or whatever, but I had to learn how to get my sexy back. And so that that was the thing to understand that you still can do some exercises. You know, my kidney is in the front, so I don't have a six pack. But I said, you know what? I don't have to be all all over. So I mean, so uh, get to a place where you groove with yourself. When you walk in the room, you still turn in heads like like what she was saying. You don't have to look like what you you know I mean. But you got to feel it. You got to feel it in your heart. You got to feel it in your soul. You got to understand I, I, I'm still worth my weight in gold, even with this tube coming out. I mean, I started going to the beach and I mean, taking my shirt off. I mean, uh, uh, however it was, I said, I got to, you know, you got to learn to love your life. You know, uh, as uh, uh, our table said, you don't know when your last moment is. So why not enjoy every moment? So that's that's how I see it. You know, so. Um, that Bible for me and cartoons, cartoons, cartoons. Man, I'm telling you, it works. And sports. Oh my God. Yes, sports. Yes. Sports. I'm telling you, sports. You got me. Hey, ah, oh, sports. And so, uh, whatever makes you happy. I think that, like, you know, if poems for do it for you, um, just don't lose uh, what is it, your personal interest. So if you like movies, still go to the movies, still live your life. If you, whatever it is, um, do it, do it, do it in moderation, um, get to where you get the strength to do it. However, I don't know. And I ain't saying go skydiving or nothing like that, <laughs> but I'm saying get your life back and enjoy yourself. I mean, it's, you still here living. I mean, there it is. There it is. I, I hope I ain't go too far. I hope y'all, I hope I said my thing on that. Yeah, that's You're good, Fred. We appreciate that. Well, oh, yeah. I want to thank everybody for listening to this patient panel. It, it's been a joy to be here and an honor. Uh, yeah. Other than that, that's all I got tonight, Phil, and yeah. back to you and Tafaro. Thanks, Anthony. We appreciate your time. And um, Fred, Bella, Artavius, Alex, we know you had to jump off. Uh, we thank you all for your time, uh, your patience, especially uh, Fred and Alex. They, they were here here from the beginning they popped in they wasn't even supposed they didn't, well not necessarily wasn't supposed but didn't have to be on yet man but so we appreciate you um coming in early like that uh definitely um mr cook mr trailer you guys anything I, I you just, guys want to say yeah i just want to say uh i just want to say thank you to the whole panel anthony your questions were remarkable that they, that was great everybody expanded well on their stories and everything uh <clears throat> It's, it's amazing when I hear these stories because it, it makes me reflect on my journey as well. Like, wow, it's kind of crazy because I think like, OK, I wasn't the only one experiencing these things. And that's what hits me hard because I like, OK, because, I you know, I, I was insecure with the tube. I had a tube in my stomach, I had a tube out my neck, all kinds of stuff. So when I hear these stories, it, it just resonates to the core because we all can relate to what was going on because we felt like it was just us on that island and no we had others and i'm glad that you know people reached out i'm glad fred made a book you know artavius is doing his thing alex is doing his thing bella we're anthony jonathan you know we're all feel we're all moving the needle in the right direction you know what i'm saying i started dialysis in 96 and it was bare you didn't hear anything like i said now you know we got people that are supporting us and, and if anything goes on guys i just want to tell you you can always call me and i can give you a little support too but wonderful show thank you all for supporting each other thank you all for bringing your stories to life man we really appreciate it thank you guys yeah thank you guys i'll I just like to say um it was an honor to uh be on this panel with you guys and listen to the uh, patient stories uh, just uh, incredible. Um, you know, my show is called Hope with Jonathan, but tonight uh, everyone's story was giving me hope. And uh, I'm a newly transplant recipient. You know, I'm a year and a half out, and I heard some of your stories. Uh, you know, you guys have been out for quite a while, quite quite a good time. So you guys are giving me hope that, uh, you know, I'll be there one day 
Uh, and uh, I know I know God will uh, continue to bless me and carry me through uh, with the great labs that I've been having. I hope to just continue on that uh, great path. And uh, you guys were inspiring. And uh, Mr. Fred Hill, man, I really appreciate your spirit and passion and, and Tay Veazey and Bella Langston and, and uh, you know, of course, Anthony Reed and Dwaylon. Uh, you guys are doing great things with Kidney Trails. So uh, everybody's everybody's doing their thing, and it's a, it's an awesome thing. So God bless you guys, and I uh, appreciate being on the panel with you guys tonight. It was an honor. Same to you, Jonathan. Uh, so to get out of here, um, I got a you know just a, a small quick uh, video. This is not really a video, video like that. This is just ways. Uh, to be able to uh, support and keep up with the people that you saw today. Uh, so, Mr. Cook, Mr. Trailer, uh, Mr. Reed, uh, Mr. Hill, Langston, Mr. Veezy, uh, Mr. Uh, Real, you know, and everybody else, uh, Dr. Brookings and Lindsay, we had on uh, on today. So, it's just, you know, uh, maybe the website or podcast or a uh, number of different things that they may uh, be uh, in charge of started themselves uh, that they that they do um, to help in the kitty uh, kidney world. So again, we appreciate you watching, uh, for sticking around with us, uh, for being here, all the, the panelists and presenters. We appreciate your time, your support, and your commitment uh, to what we're doing for the kidney uh, community. Uh, we'll definitely be back with something else. This is not where it ends. Uh, we just got started. So, you know, we got a lot of uh, to put out there and, and be informed, be educational. So, again, thank you very much. Have a great night. Have a great weekend. You guys, too. Have a great week.